Live pictures now from London. If the wind blows, you will see that flag unfurled. That is the Union Jack, and it has been lowered in tribute to Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, who died peacefully at Windsor Castle at the age of 99. Tessa Arcilia is in our London bureau. Tessa, we turn to you for the latest. We got that royal statement, of course, from the palace confirming the passing of Prince Philip. What is the latest information? Indeed, just uh, want to read a part of that. Um, it says that the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, His Royal Highness, passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle, and the Queen had announced the death of her beloved husband. That was a statement we got uh, about an hour ago um, from Buckingham Palace. So. Right now, we are waiting for details of what is next. You know, of course, Heather, protocols have been in place for this moment. And yes, there were expectations that he would make it to his uh, 100th birthday in June, but sadly, he didn't. So he's died at the age of 99. So he had requested, upon his wishes, to only have a royal ceremonial funeral as opposed to a state funeral, because he said he didn't want any of the fuss. And just uh, uh, as a background, previous ceremonial uh, funerals included, you know, Diana's Princess of Wales in 97, uh, the Queen Mother in 2002, and Margaret Thatcher in 2013. Of course, right now we are expecting reactions uh, to come. Of course, here in the UK, we had the Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, pay tribute and give his message. Let's take a listen to that first. received word from Buckingham Palace that His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh has passed away at the age of 99. Prince Philip earned the affection of generations here in the United Kingdom, across the Commonwealth and around the world. He was the longest serving consort in history, one of the last surviving people in this country to have served in the Second World War at Cape Matapan where he was mentioned in dispatches for bravery and in the invasion of Sicily, where he saved his ship by his quick thinking. And from that conflict, he took an ethic of service that he applied throughout the unprecedented changes of the post-war era. Like the expert carriage driver that he was, he helped to steer the royal family and the monarchy so that it remains an institution indisputably vital to the balance and happiness of our national life. He was an environmentalist and a champion of the national world, natural world, long before it was fashionable. With his Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, he shaped and inspired the lives of countless young people. And at literally tens of thousands of events, he fostered their hopes and encouraged their ambitions. We remember the Duke for all of this, and above all, for his steadfast support for Her Majesty the Queen. Not just as her consort, by her side every day of her reign, but as her husband, her strength and stay of more than 70 years. And it is to Her Majesty and her family that our nation's thoughts must turn today, because they have lost not just a much loved and highly respected public figure, but a devoted husband and a proud and loving father, grandfather, and in recent years, great-grandfather. Speaking on their golden wedding anniversary, Her Majesty said that our country owed her husband a greater debt than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. And I'm sure that estimate is correct. So we mourn today with Her Majesty the Queen. We offer our condolences to her and to all her family. And we give thanks as a nation and a kingdom for the extraordinary life and work of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh.
Joining in that uh, tribute uh, also is the Archbishop of Canterbury. We just uh, received a statement uh, from him. He said, I join with the rest of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth in mourning the loss of His Royal Highness Prince Philip. We also just heard from Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister of Australia, um, paying his tribute. Prince Philip was no stranger to Australia, having visited our country on more than 20 occasions and thanking him for his service. Here in the UK, the Labour leader Keir Starmer also said the UK lost an extraordinary public servant. Speaking of that public service, Heather, he had engaged in 20,000 at least uh, public engagements before his retirement in 2017. So a lot of people pointing out how active he had been um, as, you know, standing by the side of the Queen and in his own royal engagements. Now, in terms of what is going to happen next, uh, we still expect that the funeral of the Duke will be televised and held at St. George's Chapel, that is at Windsor Castle, where he died uh, peacefully this morning. But it is expected, too, that maybe the public elements of, of this protocol in place might not actually happen as planned. You were mentioning earlier that there is uh, those earlier arrangements, uh, codenamed Fourth Bridge, and, you know, that involved a procession of Prince Philip's coffin on the day of the funeral and also of, of the uh, military, um, you know, paying tribute to his service in the armed forces. But because of COVID restrictions, uh, right now, the rules in England for funerals is that there should be only a maximum of 30 people socially distanced. Um, so it is expected that the Queen might decide which family member should attend if, you know, if we are uh, uh, following these uh, COVID restrictions. Uh, it is expected that the, the um, activities uh, surrounding Prince Philip's next few days and the funeral would center around Windsor Castle rather than the more elaborate uh, plans um, during normal times. Uh, it is expected that people attending would have to wear face covers and be two meter, meters apart. And just to remind uh, our viewers uh, that Prince Philip had requested for a royal ceremonial funeral, not a state funeral. So the difference, main difference there is he wouldn't be lying in state. Um, and he says because there's just too much fuss around that. Uh, so for anyone just joining, Prince Philip has died peacefully this morning, the age of 99. He's been married to the Queen for 70 years. He was in and out of hospital for the late part of his life and we have been covering it Heather his health condition for the last month he was uh, admitted because he was feeling unwell he was treated for an infection moved to a specialist hospital because of a heart condition where he had a procedure which was deemed successful at the time and we had images of him in the car being taken back to Windsor Castle uh, but sadly uh, he has passed away now uh, this morning so we are just waiting for details of how those protocols will unfold the previous arrangements how that might be modified to fit the restrictions and the current rules COVID rules still in place in England. Heather? Yes, thank you, Tessa, for all of that. Some of those details beginning to be reported now as we look at both archival images of the prince and we're going to keep an eye, too, on the flags, now already ordered, lowered in tribute. But again, the planning was underway, according to reports, in hopes that there wouldn't be a worst-case scenario that Prince Philip or indeed the Queen would pass away during the pandemic. But that has, in fact, come to pass. And they are apparently, according to reports, desperately anxious not to have any sort of event that would attract mass gatherings. You can imagine people would have traveled from all over to see that military procession and to have been part of the funeral ceremonies for Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. But as Tess is saying, now expected to center on P Windsor Castle, where he passed away peacefully overnight and likely without that military procession element. That will mean as well that world leaders, Commonwealth representatives, as in representatives from Canada, what will happen to them? They would have been among those, of course, expected to be in attendance in large number. And that is likely not to be the case if in keeping with the rules in the UK, there is a minimum number of people allowed, 30, as Tessa was saying, the current rules for funeral gatherings, and that would not even begin to cover members of the royal family. But, John, uh, Tessa was bringing us some of the world reactions, Scott Morrison from Australia, notably the Archbishop of Canterbury, but those world leaders, those Commonwealth representatives who would have been in attendance for this funeral, they have begun to pay tribute. Yeah, indeed, Heather. We're hearing uh, from uh, Nicholas Sturgeon, someone who uh, has at various times entertained a push to separate Scotland from the UK. But here she is saying, I'm saddened by news that the Duke of Edinburgh has died. I send my personal and deepest condolences and those of the Scottish government and the people of Scotland to Her Majesty the Queen and her family. And we're hearing a lot of that. We're hearing uh, the uh, tribute to the lifetime of service. 
uh, from his military service as a very young man, a decorated war hero, uh, through then to playing the role that he played for decades, uh, his charity work, uh, his involvement in military organizations, and as has always been said, the quiet uh, support for uh, Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, we're hearing uh, from uh, David Lammy, who is uh, an a British MP uh, saying uh, that this, uh, the nation mourns the loss of an extraordinary character, again referencing serving the country in World War II and for a lifetime afterwards as the Duke of Edinburgh. Sincere condolences to the Queen having lost her husband of so many years. Uh, we, we have other comments here from, uh, this is Dr. James Davies, also uh, an MP. Very sad to hear the loss of HRH, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh at 99 years of age. He is committed to decades of service to this country. Deepest condolences to the royal family at this sad time. And of course, you, there we are, the sort of parallel themes of uh, the lifetime of service and then the personal touch. The fact that he was a beloved father, grandfather, and uh, someone who was looked up to in many respects. The Queen, uh, as, as he is alleged to have referenced her, the boss, uh, but he there as uh, the patriarch uh, of this family. Someone who, um, growing up, had uh, a very uh, uh, sad childhood in the sense that uh, there was uh, effectively had to escape. He was born on Mon Repos uh, on the island of Corfu, June 10th, uh, 1921. Uh, but his family effectively because of war and revolution scattered to the winds, uh, not uh, knowing really his father growing up, even his sisters who then went on to uh, marry uh, members of uh, the, the German society uh, and because of the Second World War and their involvement with the Nazis, his own sisters were not allowed to be uh, at his wedding and someone for whom uh, had uh, not the uh, surroundings of, of anything uh, that would be described as a, a loving or normal childhood uh, and uh, it has been criticized potentially for a certain degree of coldness, but on the other hand, it instilled in him this sense of duty, the sense of duty that he did, and, and uh, having then eventually retired uh, from his public service saying he had done his bit. We've been uh, showing the picture of him in the bowler hat and the raincoat, um, and there he was uh, greeting uh, members of the military, and, and that is an actually very symbolic outfit to wear. Uh, it's recognized in the UK that those who wear the coke hat or the derby hat, the bowler as we often call it, and that overcoat, that's what uh, retired members of the military wear when they are in uh, casual life or in business attire. And he was always very aware of maintaining his military uh, connections, the sense of duty, uh, and also the symbolism, the symbolism that he understood to be the royal family. Uh, much has been made of the fact that he pushed the royal family uh, to modernize, to televise, uh, and to reach out. And certainly, as we've talked about this country, of course, part of the British Commonwealth, the site of some 70 visits that he made to this country, of course, with the Queen, but he made many lengthy trips to this country by himself, effectively coast to coast to coast. The Duke of Edinburgh Award, something we'll hear a lot more about because there have been half a million Canadians over the decades for uh, nearly 60 years that have been honored and have uh, been able to experience the uh, awards and the fact that they recognize uh, perseverance and a sense of duty and all that arguably he stood for in so much of that. Um, an accomplished individual in so many ways. When we talk about, for example, and this has a, a statistic uh, that long before uh, we were concerned about his health and were watching uh, whether he would uh, be able to continue with his medical challenges, the idea that he was licensed to fly on virtually every aircraft in the Royal Air Force really shows a presence of mind, a stick to uh, and an ability to, to step up and to lead by example uh, will be one of the things that will, will be remembered as we uh, listen to reaction coming in from around the world uh, and as we continue to take stock of this man who living almost a century, spanning two centuries in that regard, early 20th century to early 21st century, playing a key role in the psyche of so many, 
the lives of so many Canadians and the spirit that is as we see that flag at half mast outside uh, Buckingham Palace as they will be across the United Kingdom uh, the sense that he played uh, in that society uh, and perhaps right. looking at his legacy moving forward. John, we were looking there at many pictures of uh, his visits to Canada, and I, if you would just stay with me, please, and we'll talk about those many Canadian connections. But as we look there live at London and Buckingham Palace, we would expect to see people beginning to gather and tributes form in front of Buckingham Palace to Prince Philip, who has passed away at the age of 99. And there is sadness that he did not live to reach his 100th birthday, which is in June of this year. But 99 passing away peacefully at Windsor Castle, where now we anticipate the funeral focus will be. But John was mentioning uh, some of the, the many activities. The numbers are incredibly impressive. Officially, 22,191 solo engagements. 5,493 speeches. He once described himself as the world's most experienced plaque unveiler. Let's hear more from Prince Philip himself in his own words. You've got to get away from the idea that it is possible or even desirable to tell people what is good for them. Instead, I believe we should set out to expose people, particularly young people, to as wide a variety of rewarding experiences as possible. Ignorance is the mother of bigotry, and the only the narrow-minded find it possible to be bored. Now, many of these animals that are in danger are in danger because they're being exploited, but not in a, in a practical way. In other words, that we're, we're taking more than a sustainable yield. Can I ask you finally if, if people are now coming forward at a point when it's really too late, or are you an optimist? I believe that it, it's late. There's no question about it. It's very late indeed in the, in the, in the slippery slope to, to a really explosive situation. But I think that uh, we do have a chance, but it's going to need a, a, a growth in public support. If we can go on with that, we may eventually, well, we may not put off a a disaster, but I think we might put off a catastrophe. As I was asked to start off uh, the Olympic Games in Melbourne, where I made, if I may say so, the best speech of my life, <clears throat> <laughs> which is exactly five words. <laughs> Britain is not just an old country of tottering ruins inhabited by idle roues in eyeglasses where yokels quaff ale by the tankard outside rickety pubs. The, the thing is, the, the monarchy is, is part of the kind of fabric of the country, and as the fabric alters, so the monarchy and its people's relation to it alters. Now, in 1953, the, the situation in this country was totally different to what it is now. We were a great deal younger, and I think uh, young people, a young queen and young family is infinitely more newsworthy and amusing than, you know, we're getting on from middle age and I dare say when we are really ancient, <laughs> there might be a bit more reverence again. <laughs> I don't know. From more than 73 years married to the Queen and that entire time very much in pursuit of duty or carrying out a devotion to duty as the Queen has done through her time. Prince Philip passing away today at the age of 99, looking live at London and the flag lowered as they will be throughout the United Kingdom. And we are beginning what will be a day of special breaking coverage here on CBC News Network. Tributes. We'll look back at the career and the legacy and the Canadian connections from more than 70 visits to this country. The statement from Buckingham Palace coming out just within the last hour that the Duke of Edinburgh had passed away at the age of 99 peacefully at Windsor Castle. There will be further announcements to come. Stay with us today on CBC News Network. We will continue in just a moment.
Good morning. It's 8 o'clock Eastern. My name is Heather Hiscox, and you are watching now on CBC News Network and as well across the country on CBC Television. We have special breaking coverage for you this morning of the death of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, passing away overnight at the age of 99, just shy of his 100th birthday this June, passing away peacefully, according to a royal statement, at Windsor Castle in the overnight hours. The official word from Buckingham Palace, just that, that the Queen announces the passing of her husband of more than 73 years. We begin special extended coverage for you this morning with Rene Filippone, the life of Prince Philip. Who with his hands between the hands of the Queen becomes her liege man of life and limb. For Britain's longest reigning monarch, he was the one constant witness. And kisses her on the left cheek. For more than seven decades, Prince Philip kept watch as Elizabeth transformed from princess to queen, grew from young bride to great grandmother and the world's longest reigning living monarch. Along the way, he too broke records. He is the longest serving British royal consort for the queen, a near constant shadow. And though always a step behind, his access and insight were unrivaled. In some ways, he was born to play that role. The young Prince Philip was brought up in a royal household, born on a Greek island and in line to the Greek throne. But then the monarchy was overthrown. His family was rescued by a Royal Navy ship sent by George V. At age seven, his parents separated and his mother was sent to a psychiatric clinic. He was shuffled between relatives and boarding schools, and from the loneliness, he learned to care for himself. So all of that, I think, made him a very independent person and a man who had to very much um, live on his, on his wits. He did well in the Navy, which gave him the stability he craved. At that time, I was virtually stateless, I think. Uh, I had a Danish passport, but I, the Navy said that they'd accept me. And so I went into the Navy, I think certainly at the, at, at this, the instigation of my uncle, uh, Lord Mountbatten. Philip, as a young man, was popular. It was his uncle, Lord Louis Mountbatten, who introduced him to his third cousin, Elizabeth. For her, the prince would give up his Greek title and church. In 1947, as a new British citizen, the prince had successfully wooed the princess and the nation. Again and again, the people called for Elizabeth and Philip. With the coronation, there was more to give up. This time, his Navy career. He would devote his life to supporting the British monarch. He was perfectly able to cope with that. And although people always said how difficult it must have been for him to walk a step behind the queen, I don't think that concerned him one bit. Early on, he established the Duke of Edinburgh Award for Youth. Thousands participated in the UK and in Canada, and the popular award became his most important solo accomplishment. Even as a new husband, there were rumors of affairs, certainly many a night out. Rumors of a marital rift were never confirmed. As a father, he was loving but tough. Early on, he had a strained relationship with his firstborn, Prince Charles, who was far meeker than his father. Um, I think he's always been hoping to um, you know, earn his father's uh, admiration. In fact, I don't think that Prince Charles ever quite sort of, you know, his parents never quite got it right with him. For the monarchy, the Duke of Edinburgh was a modernizing influence. He also fell into the role of advisor for other newcomers, like Princess Diana, especially when her own marriage was falling apart. When she was killed in a Paris car crash, he advised his grandchildren. Prince William was really not terribly keen to walk in the procession because he was so fed up with the shenanigans of the press and you know, not unreasonably blamed them for his mother's death. And Prince Philip took the long view and he said to him, I think when you're older, you'd very much regret not walking behind your mother's coffin and I'll walk with you. As a husband, Prince Philip was perhaps the only royal who could say anything to the queen. He was often unpredictable in public, making widely reported sexist and racist remarks, like describing Chinese people as slitty-eyed and bluntly telling British business leaders they were lazy. 
I've just done what I think is my best. I can't suddenly change my whole way of doing things. I can't change my interests. I can't change my way in which uh, I react to things. It's, it's, it's part of it's somebody's style, and, and it's too bad. He's no not one to hide his opinion, um, you know, he says this biographer who has interviewed him. With one particular book I was doing, his answers were so good that I couldn't, couldn't use half of them because they were libelous. For the Queen, his counsel and company were indispensable. They cut a figure of unity and stability in a family where marriages failed too often. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. I think it was, um, you know, it's fair to say that Queen Victoria lost Prince Albert, who was her great support at a very young age, and, uh, you know, the Queen was very lucky to have had him all those years. In his early 90s, the prince started to battle the effects of old age. He was in and out of hospital with chest infections, a hip replacement. There were constant concerns about his health, but he kept bouncing back. Not long after the marriage of William and Kate, Prince Philip announced he was scaling back. After more than 22,000 solo engagements, he felt he had done his bit. He officially wrapped up his royal career with an event with the Royal Marines in 2017. Now officially away from the spotlight, he was still supporting the Queen and his growing family. The fiercely independent prince still made headlines. Behind the wheel, he was in a car crash and had to hand over his license. In the years before his death, the once powerful voice in the royal family fading into the background, occasionally spotted, enjoying his private time. He was the oldest male British royal to ever live, and this monarchy's chief eyewitness after the queen herself. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. As we look live at Buckingham Palace, as people begin to congregate and the flag is lowered as it will be throughout the United Kingdom, you see the Union Jack there. Tessa Arcilia is with us and Tessa, just before we get to some of the reaction that we are getting, just going over with you the statement that we got this morning from Buckingham Palace, the official word, it is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. Further announcements will be made in due course. The royal family joined with people around the world in mourning his loss. His loss at the age of 99, really just shy of his 100th birthday. And Tessa, the tributes as expected coming in from public figures, from various organizations. He was affiliated with so many, politicians as well. What is some of the early reaction that you're getting there in London? Indeed, Heather. Uh, the reactions have started coming in. Of course, we have already heard from the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who paid tribute to the kind of service that uh, Prince Philip has offered to the country and the Commonwealth, and uh, ref referring to the kind of personality and the strength that he gave the Queen. Let's take a listen to what he said a little earlier. Like the expert carriage driver that he was, he helped to steer the royal family and the monarchy so that it remains an institution indisputably vital to the balance and happiness of our national life. He was an environmentalist and a champion of the national world, natural world, long before it was fashionable. With his Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, he shaped and inspired the lives of countless young people and at literally tens of thousands of events, he fostered their hopes and encouraged their ambitions. We remember the Duke for all of this, and above all, for his steadfast support for Her Majesty the Queen. Not just as her consort, by her side every day of her reign, but as her husband, her strength and stay of more than 70 years. And it is to Her Majesty and her family that our nation's thoughts must turn today.
the longest serving uh, concert there in British history. Uh, Heather, with more than 20,000 royal engagements, a lot of the uh, tributes and acknowledgement of Prince Philip's life centers around the kind of service that he has given. We heard from the Archbishop of Canterbury as well today, and he said he, consi he Prince Philip, consistently put the interest of others ahead of his own, and he thanked Prince Philip uh, as well for his contribution. We heard from the Mayor of London, who extended his deepest sympathies to Her Majesty the Queen and the entire royal family. And he said there is no doubt that the legacy of the Duke of Edinburgh's positive impact on London, Britain, and the lives of so many will live on for many years to come. We also heard from the head of the Labour Party, um, Keir Starmer. He said the UK has lost one extraordinary public servant. Uh, now, of course, what we are waiting for are details of what will happen next. You know, of course, as you have been talking about this morning, there are protocols in place, but because of COVID restrictions, the those protocols might be subject to change. But uh, what we do understand is that a lot of it will center around Windsor Castle, where uh, his, uh, he is at the moment and where he passed away uh, this morning. Heather? Tessa, thank you very much. Let us go to live pictures now. We are getting more perspectives from the city of London. This is the flag atop Westminster, the British Parliament. It, too, already lowered in tribute to Prince Philip, who has passed away at the age of 99. Buckingham Palace, the flag is flying at half mast. And also, we know that not just throughout the UK, throughout the Commonwealth as well, we're getting word that it is lowered over Parliament Hill on the Peace Tower. And we'll be looking at that for you as well. And people are beginning to gather in front of Buckingham Palace. When that uh, shot returns, we will show you those live pictures, people beginning to pay tribute. And again, as Tessa was indicating, we do expect that the pandemic will have an impact on what we're going to see in the days to come. Certainly, all of this had been organized and rehearsed in minute detail. Operation Fourth Bridge, the plans for the death and funeral of Prince Philip. But the pandemic has certainly played an impact. There are reports coming out of London that we can tell you that, uh, yes, indeed, it is still expected to be televised, as Tessa was mentioning, at St. George's Chapel, Windsor Castle. Of course, we were there most recently covering the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. But in that chapel at Windsor, it is beautiful. That is where the funeral will be held. Uh, the public elements, they will not transpire as had been planned. Um, flags being lowered all over. I'm not sure if we can go back to that live picture, but that is another standard at Buckingham Palace where we're seeing on our camera the flags being lowered there, watching in tribute to Prince Philip. And again, as we continue to look at what is coming in the days to come, they certainly, organizers, do not want to have anything that would gather people by the thousands. And that certainly would have been the case for the big military procession that had been envisaged in tribute to his long military service. Windsor Castle, where he passed away peacefully, expected to be the focal point, likely no military procession. Right now, we know that in England, funerals are only allowed to have 30 people in attendance. So we're not sure what the rules will be for this, if any alterations are allowed. But this would mean even selecting members from within the royal family and potentially all of the social distancing and masking protocols that would come with that. These are details that we will get in due course. Right now, again, looking at live pictures as uh, that camera flies over Buckingham Palace and people gather and flags are lowered. We continue to bring you reaction to the breaking news of the passing of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Joining me now... And I'm very glad that we can get this as one of our uh, initial reactions. Our former anchor of The National and our former chief correspondent, so active now with his own podcast called The Bridge, Peter Mansbridge is with me. I'm so glad to see you, Peter. Thanks for making some time. No, well, thank you, Heather. It's, uh, you know, it's one of those days that one will always remember about, you know, somebody who has been a part of our lives, so much a part of our lives for all of our lives. I'm no spring chicken, I'm in my 70s, and yet it's Prince Philip who I remember standing next to the Queen for almost all of my life. Now, you know, a number of things that you touched upon and uh, Tessa touched upon and Renee touched upon, uh, upon in her piece um, all resonate around Prince Philip. Perhaps the key one is that quote of the Queen's where, you know, she called Philip her, her strength and stay, and Boris Johnson referred to that as well in his remarks. And it's so true, because when you think of it, this man, 
for the last 75 years, there's been one thing in his life that has been the most important job he's had, which is to stand by the monarchy and stand by the Queen. And that he has done. He's got a, you know, he had a quite the independent streak, as you well know, Heather. Uh, but it was always came down to that point, standing by the monarchy, standing by the Queen. And in the execution of that royal duty, which must have felt like a yoke at some time, Peter, what do you think the, was the impact, the greatest impact that he had? Well, the very fact that he was there and he, you know, he was able to take his role and kind of, you know, he was always a step behind the Queen. So he knew where he stood in precedence, but yet he was his own person at the same time. And he stood for certain things. And, you know, the Duke of Edinburgh Awards is no small thing. We kind of slough it off as if it just, you know, was another award thing. But it was a big deal and an especially big deal to a lot of uh, young Canadians. Uh, who uh, were recipients of the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. Um, but he stood for, as you know, you heard the Prime Minister Johnson talk about, he's, he stood for the environment. He stood for a lot of different things that he made his own, and he championed those causes while always being that, you know, one step behind. Uh, he was a character. You know, I, you know, I never had an interview with him, but you know what it's like on these royal tours. You get an opportunity at certain times to kind of speak with the principals in a, you know, in a, in a, in a larger setting, kind of a, almost a cocktail party kind of thing. And uh, Philip was never <laughs> shy about letting us know how he felt about where he might be visiting or what he might have seen. Uh, he, he was always particularly good at that. It's, you know, it's, it's going to be very difficult for the Queen now, uh, not surprisingly. Her husband, her mate of 75 years, um, because if there were three people who were incredibly close to the Queen, they were the Queen Mother, her sister Margaret, and Philip. Now, sure, the kids were close, but there was a certain distance there, and still is. But those three were very close. Yes. And now all three are gone and the Queen is, you know, in her mid-90s. Uh, it's going to be a difficult time. You know, I, I was talking with Anne McMillan last hour, Peter, about when we were all there covering the Diamond Jubilee mm. and how he fell ill at that time, and she had to go to the church service at St. Paul's alone. And it was a moment where everybody stopped and paused because he wasn't with her at that time. And now, of course, that is the permanent situation. So we will uh, certainly be looking to see the Queen. We don't have word of when we will, in fact, uh, get first look at her, but many, many people sharing their concern for her at this time. Um, sure. so in terms of covering him, Peter, as you would have mm -hmm. for many times, John and I have been talking about the 70-plus visits to Canada. We can show you, I think, Ottawa already, the flag flying, has been lowered atop the Peace Tower. There it is in Ottawa, as it will be throughout the Commonwealth, as it is throughout the UK. And just getting, Peter, interestingly, some reaction from former Governor General David Johnston on behalf of the Rideau Hall Foundation and David Johnson. We share our deep sadness on the passing of His Royal Highness and some personal wishes, sincere condolences from Sharon and I, from David Johnston, obviously meeting him on numerous occasions on the times or some of the times that he was in Canada. On those Canadian visits, as you mm -hmm. covered him, tell me a little bit about the connection here and what you thought, if there was any particular affinity to Canada. Well, you, you tend to think, you know, he only came to Canada when he was doing the one step behind the Queen, but that's not the case. He came to Canada many times on his own as a result of the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, as a result of other invitations that he had. And when he came here, you know, he... <laughs> He wasn't in his hotel room at 10 o'clock at night. He, the, this is a guy who liked to get out. He liked to see people. He liked a good meal. He liked uh, the odd drink. And he loved conversation. And uh, those kind of things you heard about often in terms of his visits to Canada. Um, as I said earlier, he wasn't shy about letting people know how he felt about certain things. You know, he obviously had to uh, meet the appropriate protocols of his position, but nevertheless, at the same time, uh, he was very much his own person. Can I tell you one thing that, I, that I'll that i always remember about him? And it comes from my my last visit. But before I do, I'll, uh, have you got a moment for, to let me I, tell the story? I, your lasting memory? I definitely want to hear that, Peter. Yes. Okay. Um, 
the last time I was at Windsor Castle was for the wedding, um, for uh, for Harry uh, and Meghan, Harry I think. and Meghan's yes. wedding. And uh, I got there for the wedding itself, but I was also there about a month before as we were doing a documentary on, on the royal family and the significance of this wedding. And as a result, I got access to uh, the grounds of Windsor uh, Castle, and they are extensive. And it's almost like in parts, it's almost like a game park. It's beautiful, just, just spectacular. And Philip um, was in some ways the kind of game warden. You heard uh, Prime Minister Johnson talking about what an expert carriage driver he was. And he used to go out and, 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 and drive his carriage with his horse uh, or horses around the Windsor grounds. Um, and we were out there, didn't see him, but the person who was taking us, who had Canadian connections actually, said, that's his favorite tree over there. And I thought, what do you mean? Why is this his favorite tree? And it was a grand oak, a huge oak, a beautiful oak. And he said, it's his favorite tree because it's 1,200 years old. And I went, no, come on, it can't, can't possibly be 1,200 years old. And he said, no, 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 it actually is 1,200 years old. And whenever Philip comes out here, he always goes by that tree. And he'll park under it, he'll stand next to it, he'll touch it. That tree was always extremely important to Philip. And so I've been thinking this morning of that tree, because I know it's still standing there. And in a way, it'll be lonely without, without Philip. Two grand pieces of the British story, the British tradition, Philip and that grand oak, a 1,200-year-old oak. Um, he's he's going to be missed. He was a very special guy, uh, and he will be especially missed, obviously, by the Queen. Peter, you always make it... Uh, we understand it so much better through your eyes and your context. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and, uh, and sharing those memories, particularly that lasting one. Uh, Peter Mansbridge, as part of our coverage, as you watch on CBC News Network, and we welcome you on CBC Television as well across the country, the live pictures coming in from London of flags lowered throughout the UK, throughout the Commonwealth, at the passing of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. According to the statement from Buckingham Palace, the Queen making the announcement with deep sorrow that her husband of 73 years passed away peacefully is the word the statement uses at Windsor Castle. He and the Queen had been there throughout the pandemic really having both had their vaccination trying to stay safe from COVID-19 and they had been at Windsor Castle and of course the health of Prince Philip had been very much a focus. He had been taken to King Edward VII Hospital in London for treatment of an infection and we learned as well a pre-existing heart condition. He was moved from that hospital to St. Bartholomew's which is a cardiac specialty care facility for additional treatment and then back to uh, King Edward VII. And we had live pictures on this program, you may remember, when he returned, when he was driven back to Windsor Castle. And it is there that he passed away peacefully this morning. His wife of 73 years, the Queen, making that announcement. In terms of reaction, again, as we look at the pictures of Buckingham Palace, and as expected, people have begun to congregate there uh, and will, and we will watch over the next few days as official funeral proceedings really take off and uh, we see all of the protocol that is planned at the passing of Prince Philip. But we're also looking throughout the Commonwealth in Canada. Again, if we can go back to that picture, the flag at half-mast atop the Peace Tower in Ottawa. And from former Governor General David Johnston writing that Sharon and I, Sharon, his wife, wish to extend our sincerest condolences to Her Majesty the Queen, the entire royal family, as well as His Royal Highness's friends and colleagues in this most difficult time. That is just one of many statements and tribute that we are getting from politicians and leaders of organizations, political figures. And John Northcott is here with some of the further reaction. John? Yeah, indeed, Heather. You talk about uh, former politicians here. We have uh, from former U.S. President George Bush uh, saying this, uh, Laura and I are fortunate to have enjoyed the charm and wit of his company, and we know how much he will be missed. Uh, of course, I've heard from uh, Boris Johnson saying he earned the affection of generations uh, from around the world, here in Britain, across the Commonwealth, uh, mentioning the expert carriage driver that he was. He helped to steer the royal family and the monarchy uh, so that it remains an institution indisputably vital to the balance and happiness of our national life. Uh, a, a strange bit of arcanery here in that he was an actual 
expert carriage driver, in fact, resulted in the rebirth of carriage driving. Now, what does that have to do with any of our lives? We don't. It's a, a, an anachronistic form of transport. And yet, for a man like that, it represents the training, the diligence, to a certain extent, the personal danger, all of that that he put on the line right through his life. Uh, so again, something as arguably obs as obscure as being an expert carriage driver, being remembered by Boris Johnson to use that as a metaphor for the life that this man led. This really, by any standard of recognition, a remarkable life to be sure. Hearing from other leaders as, as well, including, um, for example, we have uh, the Locally here, the mayor of uh, Markham, Frank Scarpetti, saying this, I extend condolences to Her Majesty the Queen on the passing of His Royal Highness, the, uh, the Prince Philip. Uh, official flags at the Markham Civic Center will be lowered immediately uh, in his honor. We are forever grateful to his service to Canada. And, you know, it'll be worth noting that those flags will be lowered uh, right around the world because of the 50 plus countries in the Commonwealth, the countries that he visited in those thousands of visits abroad to them where he is uh, remembered for being uh, the individual that he was and for the lifetime of service uh, that, that he had as well. Hearing from so many others, and I'm just going to scroll through, through some of these, Nicola Sturgeon, of course, Scottish leader, saddened by news that the Duke of Edinburgh has died. I send my personal and deepest condolences, those of the government of Scotland, the people of Scotland, and to Her Majesty the Queen and to her family. And these are what we're going to be hearing throughout the day. The the, the, the dual uh, streams of the comments that people are going to make, and we're already receiving so many of them, and it's fair to say that we will continue to see them in the same vein in terms of the recognition of what was a life of service and the personal touch, the loss of a man who was uh, the, the father, the grandfather, the great grandfather to so many uh, as well. So we'll continue to uh, w watch the situation here. Um, also looking later at his involvement in Canada, some 70 visits to this country where he was the patron of some 44 organizations, the colonel in chief of six different military units in this country as well. And of course, maybe overall what he will be remembered for in this country and right around the world will be his involvement with the Duke of Edinburgh Trust and the awards that encouraged young people to have a life of service, uh, to, to uh, develop grit and to test themselves. Uh, half a million Canadians alone uh, there uh, represented through that, um, experienced that and paid tribute by him and encouraged by him on those numerous trips to Canada. As Peter Maransbridge was saying, uh, he certainly traveled uh, with Her Majesty the Queen, but he also traveled so much uh, on his own, very much uh, an individual and coming to this country numerous times on his own coast to coast to coast as we continue to watch reaction come in here, Heather. And, and John, thank you for doing that. And I also want to, I will speak to you further about those Canadian connections, but my niece, presently involved in the Duke of Edinburgh Awards program over in London and uh, very much enjoying all that it represents, as you said, that focus on, on youth and the environment and achievement. John, in terms of the personal connection here, I think we want to bring in Canadians' reaction to the passing of Prince Philip and invite you, as you watch our coverage this morning, to share your memories, any personal conversations you've had, any occasions you have met Prince Philip on those 70 plus occasions that John met when he visited our, our country. I have an email already. You ready for this, John? Yep. Uh, Rael is a friend of mine in London, Ontario, and someone who sends us pictures recently or regularly, and he sent me this email remembering 1985 when Prince Philip was receiving an honorary degree at Alumni Hall on Western's campus. And it's, I mean, it's kind of typical and, you know, sort of a bit salt, well, not salty, but, you know, it's sort of typical of Prince Philip, I would suppose. Sometime during the event, Riel had to take a break. Uh, and he was in the washroom, and so was Prince Philip. And there they were in the dignitary washroom. And as they washed their hands, they had a very polite conversation, he said. Peter was talking about how, uh, how many occasions he just uh, really loved to get out and meet people in all sorts of circumstances, apparently, and have conversations and, and speak to people. We're looking at that there on the screen in terms of how he enjoyed engaging Canadians and people everywhere in conversation. Also talking about, John, how 
He often made those quips. They became gaffes in many occasions uh, as icebreakers. Anne McMillan was telling us that because people often intimidated and perhaps a little withdrawn at meeting the Queen and meeting Prince Philip. And he was known to be uh, sort of forthcoming in that way to get to meet people. And I had a personal experience with that because I met him. We'll talk about yours in just a second when I was 17. And if you remember back in 1982, the repatriation of the Constitution, there was all sorts of ceremony, of course, attached to that. But there was a big dinner for the Queen. Uh, and every MP was able to invite a young Canadian. It was a young achievers dinner. And I was chosen from where I grew up in Owen Sound, Grey Bruce. And so I met the Queen. And I met Prince Philip. And I remember that, you know, really going out of his way to connect with young people, to engage them in conversation, to make them comfortable in the royal presence. And to this day, I remember it very, very strongly. You, I know, had the chance to uh, be with them as you covered him as he made those many visits here to Canada. Yeah, I've, I've covered a number of royal visits to this country, but the most recent one uh, was in 2010, uh, where that was his penultimate visit to this country. 2013, his last visit to this country. But to see him in 2010 in the height of summer, to see him at Queen's Park, and a number of things associated with that. First, perhaps the most beautiful Panama hat I've ever seen on anyone, a standing ramrod straight. As you can see, he, he became uh, a little stooped as he aged, but my goodness, I mean, nine decades. Uh, but there he, on that day, hands behind his back, as he, as he did uh, so often, and uh, to see him move uh, amongst the crowd uh, and to see the reaction to the crowd, mm -hmm. truly genuine and, from, and really multinational in terms of all those that have come from the Commonwealth and have chosen Canada to live in from the Caribbean, from Africa, there to pay tribute to him. But there's something else in what I'm hearing you say, you say, Heather, and it's remarkable in that there are few men who've devoted so much of their lives to duty, to doing what was expected of them, and yet at the same time, someone who royal in the sense that his connection to the Greek and, and, and Danish royal families, but uh, not really ever tapped to lead the role that he would eventually have to do, and yet remained himself. You talk about the comments, he was not shy about making comments. He was also not shy about pursuing his passions, his carriage riding, his flying that he undertook in so many ways, uh, shooting, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all the various sports and expressions of himself uh, that he did not hold back on despite all the duties, the thousands of appearances and the pressure, as we all know, on the royal family to do the uh, right thing, uh, to behave and not to be uh, caught uh, in a way that was uh, reflect negatively on the institution. He managed to be himself with those sorts of comments and asides uh, mm -hmm. and his, his, his manner, uh, despite fulfilling all that officialdom that was placed upon his shoulders. Duty, loyalty, responsibility, as you suggest, all words we associate with Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, who has passed away this morning at the age of 99. Now, normally we wouldn't share our personal stories, but it is part of the story of Prince Philip and his connection to Canada on those dozens of visits that John is mentioning. And for you, if you've had an encounter with Prince Philip on a Canadian trip, on a Canadian tour, if you've had a conversation, if you have a memory of him and a tribute perhaps to him on his passing, we would love to hear from you this morning and include you in our special coverage. You can reach our program, Morning Live at cbc.ca, that is email, and on Twitter as always at CBC Morning Live. And as we talk about Prince Philip and those tours, Solo engagements numbering more than 22,000 over his years as the Queen's husband. 5,000, here's the specific number, they've tallied it at Buckingham Palace. 5,493 speeches. Let's listen to some of them as we listen to Prince Philip in his own words. Our way of doing things means that every citizen must feel a sense of personal responsibility for everything that goes on in the community. You can't achieve any progress in civilization by passing the buck or by in indignant demands that the government should do something about it. There is no dignity about the human individual unless he is concerned with the fate of his fellow individual. We've got to get away from the idea that it is possible or even desirable to tell people what is good for them. Instead, I believe we should set out to expose people 
particularly young people, to as wide a variety of rewarding experiences as possible. Ignorance is the mother of bigotry, and the only the narrow-minded find it possible to be bored. Now, many of these animals that are in danger are in danger because they're being exploited, but not in a, in a practical way. In other words, that we're, we're taking more than a sustainable yield. Can I ask you finally if, if people are now coming forward at a point when it's really too late, or are you an optimist? Well, I, I have to be an optimist. I'm, I, I wouldn't be ta if, I, if I thought all was lost, I wouldn't be doing this job. I'd, I'd quietly go off and shoot myself or something. But I, I believe that it, it's late. There's no question about it. It's very late indeed in the, in the, in the slippery slope to, to a really explosive situation. But I think that uh, we do have a chance, but it's going to need a, a, a growth in public support. If we can go on with that, we may eventually, well, we may not put off a, a, a disaster, but I think we might put off a catastrophe. As I was asked to start off uh, the Olympic Games in Melbourne, where I made, if I may say so, the best speech of my life. <clears throat> which is exactly five words. <laughs> Britain is not just an old country of tottering ruins inhabited by idle roues in eyeglasses, <laughs> where yokels quaff ale by the tankard outside rickety pubs, and where all the soldiers are dressed in scarlet tunics and bearskin caps and spend their time marching up and down for the benefit of visitors from abroad. <laughs> The thing is, the monarchy is, is part of the kind of fabric of the country, and as the fabric alters, so the monarchy and the people's relation to it alters. Now, in 1953, the, the situation in this country was totally different to what it is now. We were a great deal younger, and I think uh, young people, a young queen and young family are infinitely more newsworthy and amusing than, you know, we're getting on from middle age, and I dare say when we... I'm really ancient. <laughs> there might be a bit more reverence again. <laughs> I don't know. Prince Philip, in his own words, Prince Philip passed away early this morning, peacefully, according to the Buckingham Palace statement at Windsor Castle. We have aerial live pictures coming in for you there, and you can see on those standards the flags lowered to half-mast atop Buckingham Palace, atop Westminster, which is the British Parliament, throughout the UK and indeed throughout the Commonwealth in tribute to Prince Philip, 73 years as the strength and stay of Queen Elizabeth and her long-serving consort. And there is the live picture from Ottawa atop the Peace Tower. Again, the flag lowered. And we're going to bring you full statement and full reaction from Canadians as well, including former Governor General David Johnston, coming up a little bit later on in our program. As we bring you special coverage now of the passing of Prince Philip on CBC News Network and on CBC Television. In terms of reaction from Canada, a statement on Twitter from the Canadian Army, from the Canadian Armed Forces, acknowledging the longstanding military service of Prince Philip with love from Canada we send our deepest condolences to the royal family today further reaction Rafe Hadel Manku is a royal historian and with the Canadian Royal Heritage Trust Rafe I appreciate your joining us this morning can you hear me yes loud and clear and I can hear you and I appreciate that if I could just get your overall thoughts at hearing the news this morning of the passing of Prince Philip at the age of 99 Rafe well what a life and uh, what a life of dedication and service and really somebody I think that uh, we can all look to as, as a, a great symbol of inspiration and someone whose life surely should be one that we could only hope to emulate uh, an unorthodox life. I mean, this was a uh, a baby born on a, on a on a kitchen table in Greece, who went on to sit on one of the royal thrones, not only in uh, Westminster and Buckingham Palace, but also in in Ottawa, in in the Parliament buildings. The Queen being Queen of sixteen realms. And what a, a a life that he led. Because we have to remember that whilst we always celebrate the the longevity of the Queen's reign. Um, it was always with Prince Philip at her side, a 73-year-long marriage, 
the longest serving consort, male or female, in British, and indeed in European history, and the longest royal marriage in British and Canadian royal history. And it was the success of that marriage, it was the strength of that marriage that became the pillar and the rock that supported the Queen so much, and lies, I think, very much at the heart of the reason for the success of the Crown throughout the, the latter part of the, the 20th century and indeed into the 21st century. Rafe, it is perhaps the, the line that she used in tribute to her husband that he is her strength and her stay for those many years of married life that perhaps will keep coming back to most often over the course of this initial immediate coverage of his passing. We remember that tribute that she paid to him. Uh, and I'm wondering in terms of the impact on the family itself, his loss, the loss to the queen, but also to the four children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren. He was such a dominant figure within the royal family. Exactly. It was one of the agreements made between uh, Princess Elizabeth at the time and, and Prince Philip that um, he was to be the authority, the main, uh, the, the main you know, figure in the, in the household running family life. And he was a great support, not only to existing members of the royal family, but people don't actually understand, I think, or properly appreciate the degree to which he was a great support to members of the royal family who were marrying in, those people who, like himself, had been outsiders. He was treated very much as an outsider. He may have been the Queen's third cousin, and they shared a common descent from Queen Victoria, but he was treated very much at the time of their wedding. Uh, as somebody who was uh, a foreigner with German links, very difficult to become accepted by a very closed British establishment of the 1940s and 1950s. And he very much had to work hard, and it was by, by, by the sweat of his brow that he proved himself. But he was able to use that experience to help and encourage and guide other members of the royal family when they actually did marry into the firm. In terms of his legacy, which we will be examining closely today and in the days to come, Rafe. What do you look to? I think many might think it is the Duke of Edinburgh Awards themselves. The Duke of Edinburgh Award scheme, I think, is the thing that he's most remembered for, and quite rightly so. Something like four million people around the world have benefited from this award scheme, which really gave people of uh, young people, including in Canada, opportunities for experiences and, uh, and other opportunities that they would never otherwise have had in their lives. In, uh, in, it was founded in 1956, but in Canada it didn't actually come into being until 1963. But since then, over half a million Canadians, young Canadians under 25, have benefited from this, and it's made a huge difference to their lives as well as to, to the lives of, of local communities. But more than that, even you know, he was one of the very first conservationists or early environmentalists. And people forget his pivotal role he played in the early days of the World Wildlife Fund. And uh, that's one of the reasons that his association with Canada has always been so strong, because of Canada's great wilderness and wildlife and, and, and countryside uh, activities. He's made more trips, as I think probably has been said many times. He made more trips to Canada than any other member of the royal family, and it was the place he visited most. 20 times with the Queen he visited, and uh, over 40 times he visited Canada uh, on his own personal visits. And uh, much of that was to involve himself with the, with the 40 odd. Canadian associations of which he was the royal patron. Yes. Many of these were actually environmentally uh, minded or a wilderness minded. Everything from you know the South Saskatchewan Wildlife Association to uh, to um, porcupine and, uh, club, rod and gum clubs, and so forth. Uh, so he really loved that aspect of Canada. So it's his it's his legacy not only in terms of the of, Duke, of the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, but his tireless support for Canadian causes. And. As someone very involved with those Canadian visits, with the uh, Royal Heritage Trust I was mentioning, being involved in those, having the opportunity to meet him, although I understand not in recent years, but uh, share some stories, if you would, Rafe, in terms of personal connection. Well, I had the honour to be in his presence on uh, many occasions. Uh, not, only got to meet him on a couple of times. The last occasion I was hoping to have met him was in 2012 when uh, he was um, uh, supposed to visit Canada House here in London, Canada's great uh, great embassy and high commission uh, for the Diamond Jubilee, and to uh, present uh, a bust of himself that had been commissioned to one of his Canadian regiments, the, the, the Royal Canadian Regiment. And there, uh, unfortunately, he couldn't come. The Duke of Kent came instead. But every other time that you had met him, what, what everyone noticed was his immediate ability to put people at ease. 
uh, and that was a, a striking quality he had, and something even you would see within within his own household. It's remarkable to realise how long members of his own staff had served with him. I don't think any other member of the royal family had staff who had served for so many decades for one person, showing the warmth of that. And his ability to actually engage engage with people on, a, on an individual basis, I think, re really stands as a, as a testament to yes. try... In, in contrast to the stereotype, I think, sometimes people have of him as being rather a gruff individual. You know, I was just talking about that with my colleague here, John Northcott, because I had the opportunity to meet him when I was just 17. And that putting at ease of young people is very much what I remember of that brief conversation and encounter with Prince Philip, at least on a personal level, Rafe. You know, when we talk about legacy, it's interesting. Obviously, we're looking back at things he has said himself over the years and uh, famous or infamous quotes from Prince Philip, but asked about legacy, and in particular when related to the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, he kind of, you know, sort of sniffed, legacy has nothing to do with me, it's there for people to use. I couldn't care less about ne a legacy. Is that something that um, you will keep in mind as you think of him? It wasn't so much for any sort of accolades. These were just things that were relevant to him, that he felt were important as part of the execution of his, of his duty in, in the role that he served. This was a man who didn't suffer fools gladly and had little time for pomp and circumstance and, uh, and the, the trappings of power and, and legacy, as you say, in that sense. He certainly would be very, was very concerned with the legacy of his foundations that he established of the Duke of Awards scheme, but that was separate to his own personal legacy. He had none of, none of that desire to be go down in history as one of the great consorts of all time. He had a job to do, and he did it. And he didn't have time for over-reflection over over or, or self-indulgence in terms of analysing one's own character and personality and, the, and one's contributions and achievements. And indeed, many of the... Uh, uh, journalists and news reporters who had uh, the opportunity to interview him learned that in in, in, uh, in in no time at all when they tried to poke him on these subjects. Rafe, I greatly appreciate your time and remembrances with us this morning. Thank you very much. Thank Rafe you. Rafe joining us from London on the passing of Prince Philip, passing away peacefully at Windsor Castle at the age of 99. Windsor Castle, of course, one of the official royal residences, but we are looking from the air at Buckingham Palace. And if that camera zooms in, obviously we're not controlling that for you this morning, but you will see the crowd has begun to gather and there are, in fact, already many bouquets of flowers now placed in front of the fence in front of Buckingham Palace. And we we will watch that over the days to come as that is likely to grow and people to gather and pay tribute to Prince Philip. Interesting, Rafe was just mentioning uh, how he didn't suffer fools uh, lightly, but also how not a man for pomp. And indeed, as we look to what we will see over the next couple of days, Prince Philip himself did not want a state funeral, as he would have been entitled to, his wishes for a royal ceremonial funeral because he didn't want what he called the fuss of lying in state for a full state funeral. He wanted a more non nonsense kind of remembrance. The pandemic has changed that, and we are looking at details that we are learning, too, of how Prince Philip will be remembered and the official protocol that we will see play out over the next couple of days. We'll bring you those details as well. Looking at those live pictures, the tributes we are bringing you, reaction to the passing of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. This was the Prime Minister of Britain, Boris Johnson, the first to react in full outside 10 Downing Street. Let's listen to that again together this morning. It was with great sadness that a short time ago I received word from Buckingham Palace that His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh has passed away at the age of 99. Prince Philip earned the affection of generations here in the United Kingdom, across the Commonwealth and around the world. He was the longest serving consort in history, one of the last surviving people in this country to have served in the Second World War, at Cape Matapan, where he was mentioned in dispatches for bravery, and in the invasion of Sicily, where he saved his ship by his quick thinking. And from that conflict, he took an ethic of service that he applied throughout the unprecedented changes of the post-war era. Like the expert carriage driver that he was, he helped to steer the royal family and the monarchy so that it remains an institution 
indisputably vital to the balance and happiness of our national life. He was an environmentalist and a champion of the national world, natural world, long before it was fashionable. With his Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, he shaped and inspired the lives of countless young people. And at literally tens of thousands of events, he fostered their hopes and encouraged their ambitions. We remember the Duke for all of this, and above all, for his steadfast support for Her Majesty the Queen. Not just as her consort, by her side every day of her reign, but as her husband, her strength and stay of more than 70 years. And it is to Her Majesty and her family that our nation's thoughts must turn today, because they have lost not just a much loved and highly respected public figure, but a devoted husband and a proud and loving father, grandfather, and in recent years, great-grandfather. Speaking on their golden wedding anniversary, Her Majesty said that our country owed her husband a greater debt than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. And I'm sure that estimate is correct. So we mourn today with Her Majesty the Queen. We offer our condolences to her and to all her family. And we give thanks as a nation and a kingdom for the extraordinary life and work of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, as he paid tribute to Prince Philip earlier this morning. And as we look at some of the images coming in from London, here is the screen atop the BT Tower. Prince Philip, may you rest in peace, sir. One of countless tributes and a photo to him as well. Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, passing away this morning at the age of 99, peacefully, according to the statement from the palace. We want to show you as well, continuing to show you the flowers that are growing now in front of Buckingham Palace. Security there, and they will be working to ensure there are no large gatherings in this time of the pandemic. They certainly don't want this to be a super spreader event, but the flowers have already begun to appear, and that will continue over the days to come. As we bring you a reaction from around the world, from international political figures and politicians, world leaders, people in Canada who had either an official connection to Prince Philip, people who met him personally, we're sharing all of your thoughts this morning. John Fraser is with me now, journalist, author of The Secret of the Crown, Canada's Affair with Royalty, also longtime head of Massey College. John, I'm glad to see you this morning, particularly on this occasion, a sad occasion for anyone who uh, loves the monarchy and certainly has watched Prince Philip these many years. Thank you for being yeah. here with us today. An honor to be here. Uh, as you see those tributes growing, people are remembering this extraordinary life, as Boris Johnson called it. What are your initial thoughts on his passing? I, I thought Johnson's statement that it was, it was an epic of service was actually wonderful. It was. Um, it, it's hard. It's hard to sum up um, such such a life. You know, uh, I can I, I, I can remember him very vividly um, uh, as, as a very, very loved human being. But it strikes me extraordinary that this man at the apex of the British establishment actually began life and his earliest life experiences were of poverty, of, of insecurity, of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a mother um, that was uh, mentally unstable, but, but a terrific person, someone who, who harbored uh, Jews uh, in the wartime uh, at the risk of her life. Um, and who was basically an international orphan, um, yes. and then came to this extraordinary life that he had of service. But his his earliest memories would be of incredible insecurity. And, and then how then did that shape him, that sort of formation, that foundation? How did that shape his approach to being suddenly the royal consort and his life of extraordinary privilege that followed? Yeah, I think it gave him a strong sense of the, of the frailty. Of, 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 of life, and I don't think he ever lost that. Um, he and it was it's his message. If you listen to any of his speeches and the causes that he went to, he was there was always a sense that that um, this was a, a fleeting world. 
because there's something to say about someone who lived just about a century, but but he's had so much experience. I mean, it's it's an extraordinary life. Um, hearing some of his wartime exploits. I mean, who who's left alive um, uh, from the Second World War that was active in it? That sort of thing. But he 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 was. Um, he was a great friend of Canada. He, he, one of his best friends was our first Canadian-born Governor General, Vincent Massey. And he often visited Massey at Batterwood, uh, in Port Hope, and, and at Rideau Hall, um, when Mr. Massey was the Governor General. And he came to Toronto specifically to lay the cornerstone for Massey College in the University of Toronto. And during the Golden Jubilee, Jubilee year, he, he came back and he was made the college's first honorary senior fellow. Um, there's only two others. The other one is the Chancellor of Oxford, Lord Patton, and, and the Chief uh, Stacey Laform of the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Um, and he was very, very proud. He was spectacular guest. Um, one of my fondest memories, because uh, it really feeds into the notion of his slightly edgy humor um, and his strong views. He, he was not... He was not a great admirer of our profession, Heather. He really of he journalists. has views about ju journalists. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, Massey has these uh, uh, fellows, famous Southern yes. journalism fellows. And I, as I took him around after the ceremony uh, of him being made an honorary senior fellow, and he was wearing the college gown. We're going around, and there were the Southern fellows all together in one group with Professor Rothstein, who was the senior Southern fellow. And I said, well, sir, here are the journalists. And he just stopped and looked at them with a sort of quizzical, and he said, what do they do? And I said, well, they, you know, they're, they're midterm, mid-career journalists who get a wonderful year off from, from their normal work and they get to study anything they want and they get trips. And he, he nodded his head and he was still moving. He wasn't going to engage them. And he said, a bit of a holiday then, is it, chaps? And they all nodded enthusiastically. And as he walked off, he turned to me and he said, bit of a holiday for all their victims too, I suppose. <laughs> oh my goodness, these are fantastic. Give me, give me more stories, John. We have an abbreviated conversation time this morning. So rather than my questions, you just tell me more story. Give me a, another story of, of your personal well, he, connection to him. He, he, uh, my personal connection was, was bad. I mean, it was, yes. it was connected to, to officialdom. Um, but I saw him once also at a birthday party for um, uh, Hillary Weston, the former Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, and yes. she, she, she and, and her husband rented the house from the Queen and, and Prince Philip called, um, uh, it was near, near Windsor Castle, and Frogmore? when she had her, uh, no, no it, it, it's, okay. um, it's, the, it's actually, it's the home where King Edward the, the Eighth signed the abdication. Um, and it's called Fort, Be Fort Belvedere. And um, so the Queen, there was a big party there, and the Queen and Prince Philip came, and he was, Mrs. Weston had all the Canadians in one in one room at the beginning to meet the Queen and Prince Philip, and uh, um, he he was he made the rounds, and I happened to be um, near um, uh, Conrad Black, who who was there. This was this was before his troubles, but his troubles were looming. Right. And um, he was Lord he, Black he at the time, at, I would imagine. Yes. He, he was, mm -hmm. and um, and he said uh, he just went by and he said, "How's it going?" And there was some grump or something. He said, "Well." Keep strong. <laughs> Just kept going. <laughs> Didn't linger. Um, but he 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 um, was um, a real human being at the center of that. There's no question in my mind is that he he was the mainstay of the monarchy. He was the one that dragged it into the real 20th and 21st century. Um, and uh, uh, he he had a sense of of what it could do and what it couldn't do. Curiously, the one episode of the of the Crown, the, the the fictional series built around the royal family, that resonated about him the most powerfully was was his his deep sense of um, faith, his spirituality, and I think that was born from his troubles in his early years. And they showed him, uh, and a true story about him. Uh, coming to terms with with um, the the frailty of, of of human nature, with with a with an institution on the grounds of Windsor Castle that supported Anglican clergy, um, it was a very interesting and moving episode in the Crown, and I think it was uh, actually very honest. 
John, I appreciate this so much. I could listen to your stories all morning. Thank you for sharing them with us on this day with special coverage as we remember the life and the many Canadian connections of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Again, the statement from Buckingham Palace as we look live at the aerial views of London, the statement that Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. That statement announced with deep sorrow by Her Majesty the Queen. We have not yet seen the Queen, and we do not know when we will, but of course, we will be bringing you further statements, further reaction to the passing of Prince Philip, both around the world and here in Canada. You're watching special coverage on CBC Television and on CBC News Network. Good morning. It's 9 o'clock Eastern. You are watching CBC News Network. You are as well, exceptionally this morning, watching CBC Television. My name is Heather Hiscox, and for the foreseeable future, I am with you as we bring you special coverage of the passing of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. The statement from Buckingham Palace coming out this morning, just about two hours ago. It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. Further announcements will be made in due course. The statement continues. The royal family join with people around the world in mourning his loss. And this morning and through this day and for the days to come on CBC CBC News Network and on CBC Television, we will indeed be covering the outpouring of sadness at the death of Prince Philip, his legacy, his countless achievements, and uh, the many connections for us in Canada to this country, more than 70 visits, more than any other royal, uh, to this country. Now, as we look at these pictures of Prince Philip from various moments in his life and his 73 years, married to Queen Elizabeth, the longest consort in royal in British royal history in European history as a matter of fact we look at the archives we look at the scenes from London this morning live pictures from across the city as we see flags lowered to half mast atop Buckingham Palace atop Westminster atop the Peace Tower in Ottawa we'll get to that in a moment but here is the scene in Ottawa as we look at the Peace Tower and it too at half mass but if we could just go back to the scene of Buckingham Palace people have begun to congregate of course in this time of pandemic they are not encouraging large gatherings but we are seeing people arriving to pay tribute there and to leave flowers the beginning of a memorial that is to play out over the next few days and the pandemic is in fact going to be affecting what we see in terms of state funeral royal ceremonial funeral, all of the protocol to come. Things are going to be affected by that. We'll talk about that in the next hour. But beginning now with a look back at 99 years of life and the legacy of Prince Philip, here is René Filippone. Who with his hand between the hands of the Queen becomes her liege man of life and limb. For Britain's longest reigning monarch, he was the one constant witness. And kisses her. For more than seven decades, Prince Philip kept watch as Elizabeth transformed from princess to queen, grew from young bride to great grandmother and the world's longest reigning living monarch. Along the way, he too broke records. He is the longest serving British royal consort. For the queen, a near constant shadow. And though always a step behind, his access and insight were unrivaled. In some ways, he was born to play that role. The young Prince Philip was brought up in a royal household, born on a Greek island and in line to the Greek throne. But then the monarchy was overthrown. His family was rescued by a Royal Navy ship sent by George V. At age seven, his parents separated and his mother was sent to a psychiatric clinic. He was shuffled between relatives and boarding schools and from the loneliness he learned to care for himself. So all of that, I think, made him a very independent person and a man who had to very much um, live on his, on his wits. 
He did well in the Navy, which gave him the stability he craved. At that time, I was virtually stateless, I think. Uh, I had a Danish passport, but I, the Navy said that they'd accept me. And so I went into the Navy, I think certainly at the, at, at the instigation of my uncle, uh, Lord Mountbatten. Philip, as a young man, was popular. It was his uncle, Lord Louis Mountbatten, who introduced him to his third cousin, Elizabeth. For her, the prince would give up his Greek title and church. In 1947, as a new British citizen, the prince had successfully wooed the princess and the nation. Again and again, the people called for Elizabeth and Philip. With the coronation, there was more to give up. This time, his Navy career. He would devote his life to supporting the British monarch. He was perfectly able to cope with that. And although people always said how difficult it must have been for him to walk a step behind the Queen, I don't think that concerned him one bit. Early on, he established the Duke of Edinburgh Award for Youth. Thousands participated in the UK and in Canada, and the popular award became his most important solo accomplishment. Even as a new husband, there were rumors of affairs, certainly many a night out. Rumors of a marital rift were never confirmed. As a father, he was loving but tough. Early on, he had a strained relationship with his firstborn, Prince Charles, who was far meeker than his father. Um, I think he's always been hoping to um, you know, earn his father's uh, admiration. In fact, I don't think that Prince Charles ever quite sort of, you know, his parents never quite got it right with him. For the monarchy, the Duke of Edinburgh was a modernizing influence. He also fell into the role of advisor for other newcomers, like Princess Diana, especially when her own marriage was falling apart. When she was killed in a Paris car crash, he advised his grandchildren. Prince William was really not terribly keen to walk in the procession because he was so fed up with the shenanigans of the press and you know, not unreasonably blamed them for his mother's death. And Prince Philip took the long view and he said to him, I think when you're older, you'd very much regret not walking behind your mother's coffin, and I'll walk with you. As a husband, Prince Philip was perhaps the only royal who could say anything to the Queen. He was often unpredictable in public, making widely reported sexist and racist remarks, like describing Chinese people as slitty-eyed and bluntly telling British business leaders they were lazy. I've just done what I think is my best. I can't suddenly change my whole way of doing things. I can't change my interests. I can't change my way in which uh, I react to things. It's, it's, it's part of it's somebody's style, and, and it's too bad. He's no not one to hide his opinion, um, you know, says this biographer who has interviewed him. With one particular book I was doing, his answers were so good that I couldn't, couldn't use half of them because they were libelous. For the Queen, his counsel and company were indispensable. They cut a figure of unity and stability in a family where marriages failed too often. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. I think it was, um, you know, it's fair to say that Queen Victoria lost Prince Albert, who was her great support, at a very young age, and, uh, you know, the Queen was very lucky to have had him all those years. In his early 90s, the prince started to battle the effects of old age. He was in and out of hospital with chest infections, a hip replacement. There were constant concerns about his health, but he kept bouncing back. Not long after the marriage of William and Kate, Prince Philip announced he was scaling back. After more than 22,000 solo engagements, he felt he had done his bit. He officially wrapped up his royal career with an event with the Royal Marines in 2017. Now officially away from the spotlight, he was still supporting the Queen and his growing family. The fiercely independent prince still made headlines. Behind the wheel, he was in a car crash and had to hand over his license. In the years before his death, the once powerful voice in the royal family fading into the background, occasionally spotted, enjoying his private time. He was the oldest male British royal to ever live, and this monarchy's chief eyewitness after the queen herself. 
Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. You're looking there and listening as live pictures come in from Ottawa this morning. Looking atop the Peace Tower where the Canadian flag is of course lowered in tribute to Prince Philip. And what you're listening is there Andrea McCready who's uh, with the Dominion Carillonners from Canada. And she is tolling there the Borden, the largest of the bells in the Peace Tower. It is tolling 99 times. For Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, who passed away peacefully this morning at the age of 99. He would have celebrated his 100th birthday in June of this year. And as we continue to look at those live pictures, we are showing you scenes from across the UK and across the Commonwealth and, of course, here at home and bringing you reaction to word of Prince Philip's passing. Janice McGregor is with me in Ottawa now. And Janice, official reaction from both the Prime Minister, which we will get to, but also Canada's Acting Governor General. That's right, Heather. Uh, you know, first, the very kind of symbolic <laughs> sights and sounds of Canada's uh, respects for Prince Philip now uh, coming in words. Uh, Richard Wagner is uh, the Chief Justice of Canada's Supreme Court, but also the Acting Gun Governor General, the Queen's representative in Canada. Uh, his official statement out first this morning, I'll, I'll read it to you in full, Heather. He said, Throughout his long life, His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh devoted himself to the people of the Commonwealth and of Canada. He stood by Her Majesty the Queen for more than six decades, a constant and reassuring presence. He valued community, duty, and service. He believed in wildlife conservation, volunteerism, and supporting young people. A tireless world traveler, he showed that Canada had a special place in his heart by visiting this country more than any other. The Duke of Edinburgh leaves a legacy that has touched so many, especially the hundreds of thousands of young participants in the Duke of Edinburgh's award program. This program, which he established in Canada more than 50 years ago, has celebrated and encouraged service and excellence among young people across the country and around the world. His Royal Highness understood we must offer the next generation's opportunities to succeed, and he believed in the power of youth to change the world for the better. And the statement from Rideau Hall continues, as a sign of our enduring respect, His Royal Highness was made the very first extraordinary companion of the Order of Canada in 2013, a fitting tribute for an extraordinary man. He was also invested as commander of the Order of Military Mer Merit, an honor that speaks directly to his own military past and his commitment to our women and men in uniform. And finally, Wagner says, uh, His Royal Highness devoted his life and his family to fulfilling his unique role in our constitutional monarchy. And he talked about how whether he was speaking with young Canadians or reviewing troops at military bases, he would constantly showed his commitment to Canada. Wagner calling him a great friend of this country and said he will be deeply missed and offering his deepest condolences. And just on the military front, Heather, I'll say, the acting chief of the defense staff in Canada has also uh, this morning already reached out to extend uh, the deepest sympathies uh, on behalf of the serving members of Canada's armed forces. Show you now uh, a statement from Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, on behalf of people. Uh, Mr. Trudeau saying it is with deep sadness that he learned of the passing of the Duke of Edinburgh. Called him a man of great service to others, first as a decorated naval officer and later as a de dedicated leader in the areas of community engagement and philanthropy. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau also talking about how the Duke always sought out the best in people and challenged them uh, to strive for greater heights. He said Prince Philip maintained a special relationship with the Canadian Armed Forces and over the years became Colonel in Chief of six Canadian units. And he talked about how in 2011 he was named Honorary General of the Canadian Army and the Royal Canadian Air Force, as, rel as well as Honorary Admiral of the Royal Canadian Navy. And the Prime Minister also talked about the Duke of Edinburgh's award, saying it helped empower millions of young people from all backgrounds to realize their greatest potential. He mentioned that he was a patron of more than 40 organizations in Canada, including uh, the Outward Bound Trust, 
the outdoors very important to the Duke and mentioned that during his last visit, again, he was made an extraordinary companion of the Order of Canada. I'll just read in full, though, the ending of Prime Minister Trudeau's statement. He said, Prince Philip was a man of great purpose and conviction who was motivated by a sense of duty to others. He will be fondly remem remembered as a constant in the life of our Queen, a lifelong companion, always at her side, offering unfailing support as she carried out her duties. He said, a family has lost a beloved husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and the thoughts of Canadians are with Queen Elizabeth II and the members of the royal family as they mourn a significant loss. Heather. Janice, I thank you very much for that. Janice McGregor with the official reaction there, the statement from the Prime Minister of Canada. We're going to go back to live pictures now as we look at Buckingham Palace and there atop the palace you see the flag lowered as it is throughout the UK and throughout the Commonwealth and that includes of course Canada. And looking at people as they begin to gather, Buckingham Palace, Prince Philip's home for the 73 years or much of the 73 years he was married to Queen Elizabeth, but they had many castles together and a favorite was Windsor Castle where he passed away peacefully this morning. I want to bring in uh, from the National Adrian Arsenault as part of our coverage and Adrian what a pleasure to have you joining us and we're going to carry on together on CBC News Network and CBC Television. But looking at what is happening at Buckingham Palace I've been thinking what we witnessed together in May of 2018 when we were both at Windsor Castle to cover the marriage of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle at the time and what I was thinking about from Prince Philip from that moment was he had just had a hip replacement. Mm -hmm. He was in his late 80s at that time, but he had that hip replacement so he could walk up those stairs into St. George's Chapel for that wedding unaided. And that spoke to his strength and that fierce independence. Talk a little bit about uh, the character of the man, the personality about the man. Well, I, how much time do we have, Heather? Because I, I think this is, you know, there is, I think this is a man that, that the world has spent a lifetime trying to psychoanalyze, you know, and, and, and trying to understand. I, what an extraordinary day that was. Uh, I remember the heat of that day. I remember lots of people worrying about him. But as always, he sort of showed up. A man of extraordinary genes, frankly. You know, the, the, the month he spent in hospital most recently was certainly the longest he'd ever spent in hospital. Yes, he marched uh, into uh, into that chapel for that wedding that was extremely important to to Harry and extremely important to him and I'm as we're looking at pictures of him as a little one I, I'm also keeping an eye on on the BBC which is doing something similar and I can't help but wonder if if at some point today that the Queen is looking at television because as we talk about a, a man that most Canadians know as a very old man this this day is sort of a, a whole tapestry of him as a as a dashing young man and and I think those those memories for her must be the most acute and and people who know him will will say that his whole life has been you know a contradiction this is a man who was an environmentalist and yet he once shot a tiger you know th this is a man who was was born to a royal family uh, was a great grandson of Queen Victoria, as was the Queen, uh, and and yet his his role was wasn't a role. His role was simply to support a monarch, to be a father to a king, a grandfather to a future king, and to carve out something for himself. You know, here's a man who who is a nomad. He uh, he he was once asked by, uh, of course, the BBC. Once asked by uh, a journalist. What language do you speak at home? Because you grew up with Danish and German and French. And his answer was, what do you mean by home? So this is a man who, who traveled the world, uh, continued to do so as, as prince consort to, to the queen. And yet he, he was made to stay put and, and was, was kept within the confines of the royal family. And you have this impression of him sort of trying to burst through the walls of those protocols. We know uh, you've been talking about it uh, so eloquently all morning, how ineloquent eloquent he was at, at times. Um, his fans will always say that he spoke his mind, and that's 
that's why he was endearing to them. His critics will always say that in the act of speaking his mind, he was deeply offensive. He, he was absolutely well aware of how often he put his foot in it. I think there is no question he sort of enjoyed it in, uh, you know, in the 70s, if, if we can find the clip at some point, um, he talked about it was inevitable that he would uh, smash into a sacred cow and step on a precious flower and fall into a, a political booby trap and he knew it would happen and, and frankly, he didn't mind at all. But as, as, as the weeks go on or the week goes on and, and we look at at remembrances to him at the core of it will always be the love story and uh, I, I sent up to the control room a picture this morning that is one of my favorite pictures of uh, the Queen and Prince Philip and I don't know if, if we have that there it is so this is the Queen having a little laugh um, she was of course reviewing the troops and wanders by and who should be sneakily dressed up uh, but that is Prince Philip there. So a little moment of them having a little laugh. I, I suspect from everything I've read and everyone I've spoken to, this private relationship that they had was very special, was very funny. Uh, and, and I think for a woman who has seen so much and lost so much, this is going to be a really hard day. I love that photo. What a choice, Adrian, because we've been hearing this morning that that was one of the things, of course, we the public don't see very often, but he made her laugh, and that was one of the things that, as you suggest, was most endearing and a hallmark of those 73 years of married life. Thank you, Adrian Arsenault. You'll be back in and through our special coverage, and, of course, we'll be leading so much of it over the days to come, and there will be days to come of special protocol, and we'll be talking about that with you in just a couple of minutes. But we want to show you some more live pictures uh, on flagpoles across the UK. Those flags have been lowered and we're looking at uh, some of them and looking at Buckingham Palace, the flag lowered of course across the UK and in front of the palace there are people beginning to gather. London has had uh, tremendous troubles with COVID-19, of course, but through a very aggressive vaccination program beginning to emerge. And Monday of this week ahead, those restrictions are set to ease. But here we have on a moment and an event that is gathering all sorts of people, and I'm sure people watching it with concern for some reason because of that. As we look, we don't have control of this camera. I'll just keep reminding you we're focused on the flag as they lower it. But in Buckingham Palace, as all of these people gather, of course, that's also something that you keep in the back of your mind. Tessa Arcilia is with us from just in front of Buckingham Palace, moving from our bureau. And Tessa, wonderful, we'll be speaking to you now uh, for the foreseeable future as you tell us about the scene and talk to people as they gather. Just give us the overview of what is happening at the palace now. Well, uh, Heather, as you can see probably from live pictures and I can see behind me, there are a lot of people now gathering in front of Buckingham Palace. I don't think COVID restrictions are stopping anyone from trying to get near, lay flowers, pay tribute, or just see what is going on or catch a glimpse of, of someone or anyone within the palace. Now, they have been uh, out here for the last uh, couple of hours, uh, helicopters in the air, and of course the world's media converging here. Heather, this is a, you know, this is, Prince Philip is an individual that is globally recognized recognized and people from all over the world as you were saying earlier are here um, you know speaking to to some of them uh, they just really want to pay their tribute to Prince Philip they know the, the longest serving uh, consort of the Queen now we've also had reactions of course from the UK first and foremost from the British Prime Minister let's take a listen to what Boris Johnson said this morning like the expert carriage driver that he was he helped to steer the royal family and the monarchy so that it remains an institution indisputably vital to the balance and happiness of our national life. He was an environmentalist and a champion of the national world, natural world, long before it was fashionable. With his Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, he shaped and inspired the lives of countless young people and at literally tens of thousands of events, he fostered their hopes and encouraged their ambitions. We remember the Duke for all of this, and above all, for his steadfast support for Her Majesty the Queen. Not just as her consort, by her side every day of her reign, 
but as her husband, her strength and stay of more than 70 years. And it is to Her Majesty and her family that our nation's thoughts must turn today. It is a, quite an incredible atmosphere here. Uh, Heather, of course, this is just a fraction of what we could expect if there were no COVID restrictions, if, if COVID was not here. I want to bring up just a few more uh, reactions of former prime ministers. Uh, Tony Blair said our whole nation is united in sadness. He will be naturally most recognized as a remarkable and steadfast support for the Queen. John Major said it is impossible to exaggerate the role that the Duke played in this in his lifetime, and he epitomized the British spirit. A lot of those reactions still coming in, Heather, not just from the UK, of course, from around the world, which we here at CBC are keeping a close eye on. Heather? Tessa, I appreciate it. Thank you. And Tessa, we should just let our viewers know, has just arrived there at the palace, and I'm looking forward to Tessa, if you can, speaking to people, their initial reactions to the passing of Prince Philip again. There are live pictures with the lowered flags, and we are seeing across London, across the UK, here in Canada, those flags lowered in tribute. Prince Philip passing away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle, 99 years of age was to be celebrating his 100th birthday in June of this year. With us now is Charles Anson, who's a former press secretary to the Queen from the years 1990 to 1997. He's in Brighton, England, for us this morning. Charles, thank you for being part of our special coverage. Good morning. My name is Heather. Good morning to you. Thank you. Uh, I am really interested in your years in the palace, dealing with Prince Philip closely and the Queen, of course. but. I'd like your initial reaction, if we could, to his passing, the word, the announcement from the Queen that her husband of 73 years passed away this morning. It's a very sad day. Uh, he is someone who has uh, made such a remarkable contribution to public life in this country, in the Commonwealth, and in countries like Canada. So we all remember him for his steadfast support of the Queen, but also as a man of distinction in his own right who made huge contributions to different parts of public life all over the world. Let's, before we get to the support of the Queen, let's focus on his own personal contributions, as you say. What do you think were the greatest of those? Well, I think uh, what he's done for young people with the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, his early support of uh, protection of the environment and wildlife, his interest in engineering and design and industry. It's this very broad range of interests, plus a huge, uh, uh, voracious interest in ideas. He really was a polymath, a, a Renaissance man, a man of ideas, but also a man of action. But with all that, his first duty, which he performed so spectacularly, uh, as the Queen recognized publicly at their golden wedding, his first and foremost uh, task was to support the Queen in all the public duties and also to um, encourage and help uh, his members of his family, not only his children, but his grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So a remarkable life spread over all sorts of fields of public life yes. and also personal. The relationship from your years there at the palace, you would have seen that up close, and you allude to the comments she made at that anniversary celebration of his being her strength and her stay. But the job that he had, that extraordinary of job of number one, of, you know, first and last, duty to the queen, never let her down. How did you see that play out as you saw the relationship up close? Well, I was press secretary to the Queen and Prince Philip and the royal family from 1990 to 97, so cerebralis and really a very difficult decade. And Prince Philip was always there, whether it was the fire at Windsor, he came straight back from a long overseas tour in the middle of the night, uh, to helping his children, his uh, daughters-in-law, uh, Princess Diana and Sarah Ferguson, a man who was very gentle and sympathetic to the difficulties of younger members of the royal family adapting to royal life. But with that, a very sort of firm and tough uh, way of uh, go going about life, setting his own very high standards and challenging other people. He had a great ability to challenge other people in a way that led to change and led to constructive change. 
and a very curious mixture of being a man of ideas, a man of action, mm -hmm. and someone who could be occasionally quite clipped in his uh, way of talking to people. He had a lovely sense of humour. He would light up a room which was often rather stiff as the Queen, as Her Majesty, as Head of State, walked into a room. Prince Philip had the great gift of being able to make a little chance remark and uh, a little bit of a joke of things, and this was a, a lovely quality to yes. see alongside the dignified reserve of the monarch. A we've wonderful looking, thing. We've been looking at a beautiful picture of them as he made her laugh, and that has been one that we've come back to, to really indicate uh, one of the aspects of the relationship. You mentioned Anna Cerebalis, and I'm thinking back to when we last spoke. I don't know if you remember it, but it was in Windsor, and it was uh, at the wedding of, yeah. of, uh, of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, and it has been in some ways another Anna Cerebalis for the Queen and for Prince Philip with that rift within the royal family. Mm -hmm. And there were reports just recently about how upset <laughs> Prince Philip was with what had been happening with his grandson, Prince Harry. And of course, now he has passed away. How, how do you think Think that dynamic is going to be played out or what will we see of that in the days to come how do you think that that may affect things well I hope that Prince Philip was spared um, the anxiety of that uh, in in these last few weeks of uh, but he was very close to his uh, grandchildren and to his first grandsons um, and I think uh, his own life has been a commitment to public duty and therefore, you know, a sadness that um, Prince Harry, with all his gifts, uh, chose to give up the life of public duty to, to choose another life in, in the United States. But right from the start, I think both Prince Philip and the Queen tried to take as compassionate a view as possible, their commitment to public duty, but equally they are... Um, they're, they are family as well, so to try and be as compassionate as possible in resolving problems. And I think in that respect, uh, he was a great support to the Queen um, in bringing up the children as well as contributing so spectacularly in so many areas of public life. Charles, thank you. I'd love to continue our conversation, but I know there are others there who have questions for you, and you must go to other interviews. But thank you for the time as part of our coverage this morning. Good to see I you again. I look forward to talking to you again. I hope so. Thank you, Charles Anson, the former press secretary to the Queen in Brighton, England this morning. As we look at again uh, some of the archives and the live pictures from Buckingham Palace, as uh, Tessa Arcilio is there, we'll be hearing from Tessa as she speaks to people, as she indicated, COVID protocol not keeping people away as they continue to gather and place flowers in tribute to Prince Philip. In terms of reaction, I'm going to bring in John Northcott. I don't know, John, if you're a fan of the crown. But I've been watching it lately. I'm late to the crown. I, I fully acknowledge this. But one of the characters I've come to enjoy most, both of the actors who've played Prince Philip in the crown, and actually that show and the makers of the drama have said they are deeply saddened by news of the death of the Duke in Edinburgh. Our thoughts are with the royal family at this sad time. People have perhaps come to know him, at least in a fictional way, by watching this very successful, very popular series. And certainly his character looms large. And and uh, this is just one of many tributes. It's coming in from the fictionalized people, of course, from the, uh, from the production people, from television in Hollywood, but it's also coming in from other realms, politics, charitable organizations. What's some of the latest reaction you're gathering? Yeah, absolutely, Heather. Uh, we're going to start off with the latest in that we're hearing. This is from former British Prime Minister Tony Blair, and he says this. Our whole nation will be united in sadness with the passing of Prince Philip. He will naturally be recognized as a remarkable and steadfast supporter of the Queen over so many years. However, he should also be remembered and celebrated in his own right as a man of foresight, determination, and courage. Heather, you mentioned uh, the crown. Even from the creator's point of view, they say it is many parts of it a work of fiction, uh, but still one that... I think it's fair to say the spirit of his independence and his strong personality, uh, his arguably thoughtfulness uh, comes through that, and his various uh, personal passions as well. Uh, we're also hearing from the president of the EU. Uh, I'm saddened to hear the passing of His Royal Highness Prince Philip. I would like to extend my sincere sympathy to Her Majesty the Queen, the Royal Family, and the people of the United Kingdom on this very sad day. One of the first to hear from was Nicola Sturgeon, the leader uh, of uh, Scotland. I was saddened by news of the Duke of Edinburgh has died. I send my personal and deepest condolences to those 
uh, of the government of Scotland and the people of Scotland to Her Majesty the Queen and to her family. Also hearing from Mark Carney, of course, the former governor uh, of the Bank of Canada, but also, of course, uh, the former head of uh, Britain's bank as well. And coming out and saying this, Prince Philip dedicated his life to the service of others. He was a true friend of Canada, and he will be greatly missed. There, of course, from the head of the former governor of the Bank of England. And we're also hearing from uh, former U.S. President George Bush, saying he represented the United Kingdom with dignity and brought boundless strength and support to the sovereign. Laura and I are fortunate to have enjoyed the charm and wit of his company, and we know how much he will be missed. Of course, over the years, the royal family did visit several White Houses and met several presidents uh, and their families as well. And again, one of the very first to come out and speak at the podium there, set up outside 10 Downing Street, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Let's hear from him. Her Majesty said that our country owed her husband a greater debt than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. And I'm sure that estimate is correct. So we mourn today with Her Majesty the Queen. We offer our condolences to her and to all her family. One final comment I'm going to pass along from the Archbishop of Canterbury and speaking a very human reaction to who Prince Philip was, talking about his obvious joy of life, his inquiring mind, and his ability to communicate with people or from two people from every uh, background and walk of life. And it is certainly someone who uh, certainly did not, in many respects, choose the life that was his. Uh, war and family strife, uh, separation, uh, all of which, uh, but uh, an individual who, uh, meeting the Queen when she was very young, she was still effectively a teenager, there in his naval uniform, and someone who uh, carried on that relationship and grew into the role, and in many respects, as we're hearing this morning, credited with bringing the royal family forwards uh, into what was uh, the latter half of the 20th century and into the new century as well, the idea of televising events and the ability to reach out to people and to remain relevant, and that is certainly something that the family, as it has perhaps struggled with in recent years, is something that was very top of his mind with his Duke of Edinburgh awards, with his multiple trips abroad, often uh, by himself, with his involvement in so many charities and communities, worth pointing out, 44 of them in Canada that he's a patron of, someone who, despite the uh, separation uh, that his role and the uh, elevated uh, aspect of the royal family might interfere with, at the same time someone who did try to remain relevant and did try to reach out to people and is being remembered as much for the person he was as for the role that he fulfilled. Heather? John, thank you very much. And John, come back if you would with further reaction. It's continuing to come in from across this country. We'll bring you more of that in a moment. But as we look live once again at Buckingham Palace, as people continue to gather and pay tribute to Prince Philip. We know that over the days to come, we are going to see much of the British pomp and the British ceremony that, of course, we've come to know over these years. None of this is random. Everything is planned in minute detail for the passing of a royal and has been in place for the passing of Prince Philip for some time, one would anticipate. We know it's not going to be a state funeral. Those were his wishes, a royal ceremonial funeral. Let me bring back the Nationals' Adrian Arsenault, looking ahead to what this event, this sad event, Adrian, has triggered. It even has a name, does it not? Operation Fourth Bridge. That's exactly right, Operation Fourth Bridge. It's, you know, th that is a dusty book, Heather, that has been passed uh, through newsrooms in the United Kingdom. Uh, people have spent their entire careers handing over this book from one to another because it outlines, particularly in the United Kingdom, with, with precise, with precision, exactly the music that is supposed to be played in the UK the time things are supposed to be announced, the way it is supposed to unfold. Uh, and of course, the Duke of Edinburgh would have been across all of those details. You know, time changes, uh, the era moves, technology shifts, uh, and so some things have changed, but the fundamentals are, are clear that uh, he did not, he was very, very specific. He did not want a ceremonial funeral. He did not want to, to lie in state. That is likely 
it, it is likely that will not happen at all. He will get those wishes. So there is a very strict list of, of protocols that need to be followed uh, f for the national mourning of Prince Philip. Yes, we know the flags are lowered to half mast across the UK. We don't yet know when we will see the Queen, but when members of the royal family emerge, they will all don dark colors and armbands. Uh, MPs will also wear black armbands and black ties. Sometime soon, we think, uh, Prince Philip's coffin will move to St. James Palace. It will rest in the Chapel Royal. So what's interesting about that is that that is the place where um, Diana remains rested as well as the Queen Mums. The Queen, when the Queen Mum died, by the way, in 2002, that was the last time that there was a large state funeral uh, in the UK. So his body will stay there for about a week, then seven days after the date of his death, his coffin moves to Queen's Chapel. There will be a vigil that will be mounted by his children. The day after that, the Duke of Edinburgh will be laid to rest. So a gun carriage procession will wind from the chapel past Buckingham Palace to Wellington Arch. From there, it will make the journey through Windsor to St. George's Chapel. That's where Meghan and Harry were married, if you recall. Prince Philip, uh, as we've said, you know, he is eligible for a full state funeral, but in typical form, he asked for very little fuss. So it, it will be something akin to a, a royal ceremonial service that will honor his place, uh, his life, that will, that will happen probably in the afternoon. And remember, we talk about anticipating, Heather, you know, the crowds, but time marches on. This is an era of COVID. There are very clear restrictions about crowds in the UK right now. Funerals are limited to 30 people. Uh, so how the royals will navigate this one, uh, not entirely clear. It will be a very small invitation list. And from everything we understand about Prince Philip, that would suit him just fine. He did not fuss, as he explicitly stated. Adrian, just as we continue to look at archives in Buckingham Palace, just a little bit of detail uh, for the two of us to look at. Mm -hmm. um, coming out of The Guardian, the reports are that the pandemic is very much going to affect things, that they'd been planning for this and had been hoping that he would not pass away during the height of the pandemic, of course, because they don't want people to gather. And they also knew that the large military procession, for example, that would have been held to honor his distinguished naval service would be impossible. So you're quite right. You were talking about funerals. I believe it's 30 people. That's all that is allowed for uh, current rules in funerals. And one would imagine that may, if they're forced to adhere to those, that may force some very difficult choices on which members of the royal family attend. Absolutely. And, and you know, this is something, again, if we go back to, to the Queen and Prince Philip as a couple, um, it, it, it's interesting, Heather, to think that, that COVID has a, clearly affected them as well. They, they were in isolation for a long time. Now, living in, this is not a hardship, right? They, they were living largely in Windsor Castle and they were well cared for. Uh, there was a team, a smaller team of people who were there to protect them during COVID. And they were, uh, but they were fundamentally kept from their children, their grandchildren, uh, friends. Uh, it was described as, as quite a lonely time for the Queen and Prince Philip. And then for him to go into hospital, it was especially lonely for the Queen. You saw you, you saw in the last few weeks some shifts. Prince Prince uh, Charles showed up a little bit more. Prince William showed up more. Uh, there was an effort to talk more about the family. This was happening, of course, as the Meghan and Harry interview was unfolding. But at, when you think of it as a family, like a lot of families around the world during COVID, they, they were kept apart. So this has been very difficult for them. And there has been lots of time for him for them to think about what to do. We know that one thing Buckingham Palace is pretty good at is offering explicit details and explicit plans. So we fully anticipate that the palace will provide us a very clear update on funeral plans and that they will likely be reduced from what was already a reduced plan. It was, you know, he made it clear he didn't want to fuss. COVID enters the story and so now what Operation Fourth Bridge had planned will probably have an asterisk next, next to it and, and it will be trimmed down even further. As soon as that briefing happens, uh, we will let you know. We don't expect an update on that today. Today will be, uh, uh, the palace rightly 
identify as a day to consider the full measure of the man. What to do uh, for the funeral will probably come in the days to come. Perhaps even as early as tomorrow. Likely the indications are confined to the grounds of Windsor Castle, as you suggest, but full details, yes, coming from the palace at some moment in the near future. Adrian, thank you very much for all of that. The Nationals' Adrian Arsenault as we continue with special coverage both here on CBC News Network and on CBC Television as well. And as you look live at Buckingham Palace and at the crowd that continues to gather, you'll notice the flag has been lowered as it is in Ottawa. We want to take you to the nation's capital here for the scene but also for the sound. <laughs> Ninety-nine times, ninety-nine, that bell was tolled in the Peace Tower, the largest bell in the Peace Tower by the famed Carol Honor Andrew McCready, as she paid tribute there on behalf of this country to Prince Philip, and you see the flag lowered atop the Peace Tower as well. The Canadian reaction has been very rapid and very thorough, as you might expect. And our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, is part of our special coverage as well. Thank you for coming in on all of this, Rosemary. Right. Really appreciate it. Uh, we should start as a matter of protocol with the acting governor general. What are we hearing from him? Yeah, that's right, because there is a lot of protocol in these kinds of events, as you can imagine, Heather, and so that's who we did hear from first. Uh, the acting governor general is none other than our chief justice, Richard Wagner. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about what he had to say about Prince Philip. He says, throughout his long life, his royal highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, devoted himself to the people of the Commonwealth and of Canada. He stood by Her Majesty, the Queen, for more than six decades, a constant and reassuring presence. He valued community, duty, and service. He believed in wildlife conservation conservation, volunteerism, and supporting young people, a tireless world traveler. He showed that Canada held a special place in his heart by visiting this Canada, uh, country more than any other. He goes on to say that he leaves a legacy that has touched so many, especially the hundreds of thousands of young participants in the Duke of Edinburgh's awards program. The program, which he established in Canada more than 50 years ago, has celebrated and encouraged service and excellence among young people across this country and around the world. His Royal Highness understood we must offer the next generations opportunities to succeed, and he believed in the power of youth to change the world for the better. Um, after hearing from, of course, the acting governor general, it was then the prime minister's turn, turn to uh, offer his condolences to the queen and, and to the country. He talked about the deep sadness that he felt learning of this passing, how he was a man of great service, both um, a naval officer and a dedicated leader. He talked, too, about the Duke of Edinburgh's awards program, which, which helped many, many young people. Um, but he, it was just at the end of the Prime Minister's statement where it became a little more personal and, and he reflected a little bit more. And he said the following, quote, Prince Philip was a man of great purpose and conviction who was motivated by a sense of duty to others. He will be fondly remembered as a constant in the life of our Queen, a lifelong companion who was always at her side, offering unfailing support as she carried out her duties. A family has lost a beloved husband father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. The thoughts of Canadians are with Queen Elizabeth II and the members of the royal family as they mourn such a significant loss. And, and you heard in both those statements about Prince Philip's, uh, the fact that he visited this country so often. In fact, more than 70 times he came here, both with the Queen and on his own. And of course, it, in moments like this, it is probably worth reflecting on the fact that our Prime Minister's father had also a relationship with the Queen and Prince Philip. I, I went back to look at that famous picture of um, Pierre Trudeau Sr. pirouetting behind uh, the Queen as they went to dinner at the G7. And indeed, Prince Philip, you can spot him on the edge of that photo too. Um, I was there when the Prime Minister went to have his first audience with the Queen when he first became Prime Minister in, in 2015. Um, they have a very uh, amicable relationship, quite close, I should say, when they had their first audience together. The Prince was not there at the time. But we also know that the Duke of Edinburgh was very interested in politics, and he did keep an eye on Canadian politics to the extent, uh, in particular, 
at a time when uh, sovereignty seemed a, a real possibility in Quebec, and he was very concerned about how uh, the impression of the monarchy in Quebec was going to affect Canada's relationship uh, with the royals. Of course, none of that came to pass in terms of a referendum and separation. Some of those, those feelings are, are lingering in parts of Canada and in parts of Quebec, and so it was something that he kept an eye on and, and talked to the Queen about time and again um, as, a, as it flared up. Um, but I think it's fair to say that, that he, too, had a, a sort of a special relationship with, with this country and the fact that he came here so often for so many different things and was awarded various honors um, with both our military and from our governor's general speaks to uh, Canada's fondness for him as well. Rosie, thank you. I very sure much thanks. appreciate that. We'll speak again. Rosemary Barton, our chief political correspondent. She is in Ottawa this morning as we look at Buckingham Palace and not just reaction from, from Ottawa and from federal politicians. We're hearing word from premiers as well in Canada's provinces, including a statement from Dennis King, who's the premier of Prince Edward Island. And as part of his statement, he writes that His Royal Highness uh, we've been pleased to welcome His Royal Highness to Prince Edward Island numerous times since 1951 when he first visited with Princess Elizabeth prior to her ascension to the throne. 1951, we've been talking that, the first official visit. He had come as part of naval duties in 41, but in 51, his first official visit when she was Princess Elizabeth. And this is the time when, as uh, the Premier of Prince Edward Island reminds us, they were really kind of the William and Will and Kate of their day. They were this dash glamorous young royal couple. He made his first speeches in Canada during that time in 1951 and fond memories of all of those moments and also obviously reciprocally from the places that hosted him including Prince Edward Island. Um, and I happened to be in Prince Edward Island when Will and Kate made their first visit there. So it's a bit of a first circle moment as we talk about the island and its many royal ties. Dennis King, one of the premiers reacting, we will continue to bring you full reaction here in Canada and internationally to the death of Prince Philip at the age of 99. Connie Miller is with me now, and Connie is the executive director of the Nova Scotia Division of the Duke of Edinburgh International Awards. Connie, I'm just delighted to welcome you this morning. Thank you very much. From Nova Scotia, Upper... How, oh, can it cook or is it Kennet cook? I've forgotten. I'm sorry. I lived in the province. I've forgotten. It's, it's Kennet cook. And Kennet thank you cook. for having me. Well, listen, I'm very yeah. glad to have you here, Connie. Thank you very much. Um, your thoughts today. We've been mentioning already in our special coverage many times that much of the world looks at the Duke of Edinburgh Awards as Prince Philip's greatest legacy. What is your sense of it? I, I would have to agree with that sentiment, of course. Um, the impact that he's had since 1956 around the world on millions of youth, uh, well over 10 million of youth who have achieved this award, uh, it, it's just astounding. And it, it's, it's still as effective uh, and impactful today as it was when it began, um, maybe even more so, um, you know, filling that need for youth. Tell me a little bit about, I mean, we've all heard the phrase the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, but maybe not everybody is aware of what it exactly encompasses. Mm -hmm. So tell me that many, many, this is very detailed. This is very intense at a certain point to reach this level. Oh, yes. Yeah, th this, is a, this is something that youth must achieve. They must work for. It's not given to them um, because they would like to have it, if you know what I mean. This is a, a framework. It's an experiential learning framework where youth can earn bronze, silver, and gold awards. Um, but for each award, it becomes more challenging, and they must be challenged in four aspects of, of their life. So they must be involved in physical activity, in volunteering, in learning new skills or enhancing skills so they continue to learn, and then they must be involved in the environment by, by working in teams and exploring the, the outdoor, going on adventurous journeys. And they become more and more challenging as they they go up through the levels they yeah. dedicate to get these levels they dedicate you know three to five years minimally of their life to to being able to achieve these awards i was mentioning earlier in our broadcast one of my nieces who lives in london is presently enrolled in the duke of edinburgh program there in london england and i've been so yes. impressed to learn what it involves what do you think the young people who emerge from it with those gold silver or bronze categories what what have they developed as a result of Prince Philip's vision? They've developed self-confidence, resilience, a passion, 
um, persistence, all of the soft skills, like this experiential learning model that we have is a great um, a ca companion to the formal education that, that youth receive. But in, in the experiential learning, they must challenge themselves to take on uh, things they may not normally be, be thinking of doing or that is prescribed to them through a curriculum, correct? You know, they, they find, they must find things that they're passionate about to, to volunteer, to, to learn, to grow, um, and, and they must be challenging. So they, they, they learn how to, to persevere and they come away with a sense of competence that is is unmatched, really. And and it's they do the work themselves. They are mentored by leaders and other adults in the communities. But they give back into the communities. In Canada, for example, last year alone, uh, close to 100,000 hours were given back to communities just in volunteering by award achievers. Amazing. You know, I was reviewing some of his comments about his awards because he was asked about it specifically. And was asked pointedly whether this was what he considered to be his greatest legacy. And in typical Prince Philip fashion, he kind of sloughed that off and said, legacy, you know, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, this is what's relevant. This is what's, you know, relevant. That's why I'm doing it, not for accolades or legacy or anything like that. This is relevant to the youth of today. That kind of how he perceived it, uh, how does that strike you? Yeah, I would say that that's very much the, the way he would perceive it. And I think that's very much the way the award is perceived. Like, this is... This isn't about prestige. This is about developing youth, right? And he was passionate about about that, about seeing the best in youth and helping them see the best in themselves. So that's truly the legacy. And that's why this framework um, that was so uh, fitting for the youth of 1956 is still so important for the youth of 2021 uh, because it is about them in their world and developing their own passion and desires and uh, place in, in our societies. Um, and they truly do give back and they truly do develop this sense of purpose. Dare say maybe even more relevant today, perhaps. Um, One might think. Yes. Have you had occasion to meet him personally at all, Connie? I have not met Prince Philip personally, no. No, I have not had the pleasure. But certainly, obviously, inspired by him and all that he's brought with the award. Um, what do you think within Canada, within the many branches, the yours is Nova Scotia's, what will you be doing, if anything, in terms of acknowledgement or tribute or, or anything to, uh, to your, your namesake? Yeah, we, we certainly will. It's the early stages, of course. Um, um, and also, he, you know, his birthday was pending, you know, uh, in June. So of course we were, you know, we've been been thinking about him and how we can celebrate his his legacy. So things will be unfolding, um, you know, in the in the in the new in the days and, and weeks to come for sure. But but he will be commem commemorated through this award. Well, we'll be back sure. in touch with you to look ahead to yeah. that. Maybe a last word from you, if I could, Connie. Again, you've spoken so eloquently of what this award stands for. But again, a, a closing thought on what uh, Prince Philip has meant to the impact, really, I suppose, globally through this award? It really is astounding. It's hard to put it in words, but it truly is an example of a living legacy. You know, this, this legacy is going to live on well beyond Prince Philip and well beyond any of us who are working in the award today. It's, it's, it's grounded in this um, you know, giving back to youth and the youth um, uh, adopt this program and they give back to their communities. It lives beyond him. It's a living legacy. And although today is a day that the award family is saddened, it's also a day of great reflection for us and gratitude um, to the man and his vision. Connie, I very much appreciate your joining us in this part of the legacy of Prince Philip. Thank you very much. Connie is oh, with us from Nova Scotia. Me. I appreciate that. The executive director of the Nova Scotia Division of the Duke of Edinburgh's International Award. And again, as we look live at Buckingham Palace, if you are just joining us, we have special coverage and will for the foreseeable future. It is a major breaking story announced early this morning by the palace, the passing of Prince Philip. And the statement came out from the palace announcing that the queen 
has, uh, in great sadness, announced the passing of her husband, her beloved husband, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. The statement goes on to say that he passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle, that further announcements will be made in due course. We do understand that there will be no detail today on his funeral or any ways in which the pandemic may have changed the plans for that commemoration. But today is a day for reflection on his life and legacy, as Adrian Arsenault summed up, the measure of the man. And that is what the world is doing right now. But in due course, we will learn about the protocol that we will witness play out for the next couple of days. And the final statement from the Buckingham Palace communications on behalf of the Queen, the royal family join with people around the world in mourning his loss. We are bringing you reaction from here in Canada, from around the world. We invite your participation in all of this. John Northcott's been telling us about the 70-plus Canadian trips Prince Philip made, and perhaps you have an encounter that you want to share with us, a memory, a tribute to him. We welcome that this morning. Uh, we are at CBC Morning Live. If you want to tweet us in CBC Morning Live, at cbc.ca. Again, as we look live at Buckingham Palace, the flag is lowered, the crowd is gathering, the tributes in terms of bouquets of flowers, they are piling up there in front of the palace gates. And we will be live to bring you ongoing special coverage here on CBC News Network and on CBC Television. Good morning. You're watching special coverage on CBC Television and on CBC News Network. Prince Philip, the husband of Queen Elizabeth II, has passed away at the age of 99. I'm Heather Hiscox, and with me this morning from the National CBC Senior Correspondent as well, Adrian Arsenault. Adrian. Good morning, Heather. Well, as we know, news of Philip's death came to us this morning, as we knew it would in a statement from Buckingham Palace, which read, It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. So Prince Philip, as we know, was 99. He would have celebrated his 100th birthday, and I suppose that letter from the Queen uh, this June. <laughs> That's right. A personal, personal message just handed to him, perhaps. <laughs> yes, and that is an element of the additional sadness, of course, that the family will not get to celebrate that milestone 100 years in June. But first, in the tributes to Prince Philip, we look at his life and legacy, the words of the Queen. From their golden wedding ceremony, we go back to their anniversary ceremony in 1997. You'll remember the famous statement from the Queen as she called her husband her strength and stay for all these years adding how she, her family, and the country, the nation, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. He was royal consort for 73 years, the longest serving in British royal history. And so, you know, obviously, this is a man who, who traveled, collected a lot of air miles for a royal, uh, but is being remembered as a very good friend to Canada. He, he once joked that they... You know, he and the Queen did not come to Canada for their health. They thought of, uh, they had other ways to enjoy themselves, but they spent a stunning amount of time in this country. Uh, secretly, we all think they quite liked it. So let's take a live look now at Parliament Hill because he was so important to this country. That, of course, is the Canadian flag on the Peace Tower at half-mast. We understand that it will stay at half-mast from now until sunset on the day of the funeral or the memorial service. So last hour at 9 a.m. Eastern, the largest bell in Peace Tower in Parliament Hill told 99 times in tribute.
There will be time in the days to come to learn more about the details of the funeral, of the memorial services, however they can happen in this era of COVID. Uh, but today is a day for talking about the man. So throughout his long life, His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, we know devoted himself to the people of the Commonwealth and of Canada. He stood by Her Majesty the Queen for more than six decades, seven decades, a constant, a reassuring presence. He, she called him her rock. We know he valued community, duty, and service. He believed in wildlife conservation, volunteerism, and supporting young people. This is a statement, by the way, from the acting governor general, who describes him as a tireless world traveler. He showed that Canada held a special place in his heart by visiting this country more than any other. The Duke of Edinburgh leaves a legacy that has touched so many, especially the hundreds of thousands of young participants in the Duke of Edin Edinburgh Awards program. This program, which he established in Canada more than 50 years ago, has celebrated and encouraged service and excellence among young people across the country and around the world. His Royal Highness understood we must offer the next generations opportunities to succeed, and he believed in the power of youth to change the world for the better. As a sign of our enduring respect, His Royal Highness was made the very first extraordinary companion of the Order of Canada in 2013, a fitting tribute for an extraordinary man. He was also invested as commander of the Order of Military Merit. That's an honor that speaks directly to his own military past and his commitment to our women and men in uniform. So His Royal Highness devoted his life and his to his family and to fulfilling his unique role in our constitutional monarchy. Again, this continues to be the statement from the acting governor general. Whether speaking with young Canadians about their hopes and dreams, presenting colors and meeting troops at military bases and events, or representing the crown at state occasions, Prince Philip constantly showed his commitment to Canada. He was a great friend of this country and he will be dearly missed. On behalf of all Canadians, Richard Wagner says, I offer my deepest condolences to the members of the royal family. Adrian, we're going to look next live at London and the scene at Buckingham Palace. And you can see there is a crowd that has gathered. We've seen the numbers increase over the course of the morning. The flag also lowered there. And we've been seeing people place flowers in tribute to Prince Philip in the hours since news of his death was first announced earlier this morning. We're going to bring you reaction from those people who are gathered outside the palace. We have our reporter Tessa Arcilia there in position. Of course, for Canadians and for people the world over. Prince Philip was one of the most recognized symbols of the monarchy. He was always, it seemed, at Queen Elizabeth's side. Barely a time when you can't remember when they were not together or he a step behind her, hands behind his back, as was his way, and that compelling look on his face. Here is Rene Filipponi with a look back. Who, with his hands between the hands of the Queen, becomes her liege man of life and limb. For Britain's longest reigning monarch, he was the one constant witness. And kisses her on the left cheek. Over more than seven decades, Prince Philip kept watch as Elizabeth transformed from princess to queen, grew from young bride to great grandmother, and the world's longest reigning living monarch. He is the longest surviving British royal consort. In some ways, he was born to play that role. The young Prince Philip was brought up in a royal household born on a Greek island and in line to the Greek throne. But when the monarchy was overthrown, his family left, and after his parents separated, he was virtually on his own. So all of that, I think, made him a very independent person and a man who had to very much um, live on his, on his wits. He met the future queen while serving in the Navy, and then by 1947, the prince had successfully wooed the princess and the nation. With the coronation, he gave up his Navy career and devoted his life to supporting the British monarch. His most important solo accomplishment, establishing the Duke of Edinburgh Award for Youth, first in the UK and in Canada. As a husband, Prince Philip was perhaps the only royal who could say anything to the Queen. He was often unpredictable in public, 
making widely reported sexist and racist remarks. I can't suddenly change my whole way of doing things. I can't change my interests. I can't change my way in which uh, I react to things. It's, it's, it's part of it's somebody's style. In his early 90s, the prince started to battle the effects of old age. He was in and out of hospital. Concerns about his health were constant, but he kept bouncing back. Then, at the age of 96, after more than 22,000 solo engagements, he felt he had done his bit and retired from his royal career. Out of the spotlight, he was still there for his growing family, even stirring up concern with a car crash that saw him lose his license for good. For the Queen, his council and company were indispensable. He has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. He was the oldest male British royal to ever live, and this monarchy's chief eyewitness after the Queen herself. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Now, as we look once again at the Peace Tower and the lowered flag where it will continue to fly at half-mast until the day of the memorial or the tribute, and we listened in as the bell tolled 99 times for the 99 years of life of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Further reaction from Ottawa, and again, we bring back our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton. Rosemary, Adrian was uh, sharing with us the acting governor general's uh, statement, a fulsome one, and we know that we have also from the Prime Minister. Can you share some further reaction from Canadian leaders? Yes, and uh, the, the Prime Minister obviously will have met Prince Philip and the yes. Queen, so his, his reaction might be um, a little different. I should point out to people that the Prime Minister's uh, regular Friday COVID uh, press conference will go ahead at 11.30, and obviously we would expect him to make uh, some comments off, off the top, so we can wait for that. But in the meantime, uh, I can share some of his statement with you, pointing out, too, as we talked about the extensive relationship between the royals, uh, Prince Philip, and this country, that in 2011 he was awarded the honorary uh, General of Canada um, for the Army and the Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, he was also the first ever extraordinary companion of the Order of Canada, which is the, the top of the top if you want to be in the Order of Canada. And he was the first one to receive um, that honor. But let me share with you some of what uh, the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau had to say this morning, learning of this death, obviously expressing deep sadness, learning of the passing of the Duke of Edinburgh. He talks about his philanthropy, his public service, his service in the military. Uh, he said that Canada maintained a special relationship with the Canadian Armed Forces and over the years became Colonel-in-Chief of six Canadian units. And as I mentioned there, in 2011 was named Honorary General of the Canadian Army, the Royal Canadian Air Force, as well as Honorary Admiral of the Royal Canadian Navy. He goes on to say the following, the global program that bears his title, the one that you've been talking about so much this morning, the Duke of Edinburgh's award, has helped empower millions of young people from all backgrounds to realize their greatest potential and is but one example of his contributions to the social fabric of this country and the world. He was also the patron of more than 40 organizations in Canada, including the Canadian Aeronautics and Space Institute, the Outward Bound Trust. And during his last visit to Canada in 2013, April of 2013, the Duke was named, as I said, the first extraordinary companion of the Order of Canada. He goes on to say Prince Philip was a man of great purpose and conviction, who was motivated by a sense of duty to others. He will be fondly remembered as a constant in the life of our Queen, a lifelong companion, who was always at her side, offering unfailing support as she carried out her duties. A family has lost a beloved husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. The thoughts of Canadians are with Queen Elizabeth II and members of the royal family as they mourn such a significant loss. We've also heard uh, tweets from various premiers. There was a reaction as well from the uh, leader of the official opposition, Aaron O'Toole. So everyone weighing in uh, with their condolences for the royal family. I'll point out that the last time the prime minister had to sort of weigh in on Canada's relationship with the royal family came after the fallout from the Meghan uh, Markle interview with, with Oprah when there was questions about 
whether there were issues of racism or indeed even systemic racism inside the royal family. Obviously, the prime minister didn't want to get involved in that conversation, but he did reaffirm uh, he, the, the, monar the monarchy's importance in, in, in our life in, and in the country's life and didn't think that it was the time to start a conversation about whether that role needed to be redefined. So um, he himself certainly committed to, to that relationship still, has a close uh, relationship, I would say, with the Queen. Be interesting to see if he has any personal reflections about his encounters with Prince Philip or indeed his, his father's many encounters with Prince Philip and the Queen uh, during his time as Prime Minister. But again, Heather, we will hear directly from the Prime Minister at around 1130 Eastern. You're absolutely right. You mentioned last time you remember yeah. that famous pirouette photo of Pierre Trudeau behind the back of the Queen, and I immediately went there mentally to Rosemary. So <laughs> perhaps we'll have some recollections yeah. from the current Prime Minister on uh, those many connections. Thank you, Rosemary Barton, Thanks, our chief political correspondent. Now, as we continue to bring you further reaction to the passing of Prince Philip, looking there again live at Buckingham Palace, so much of the focal point right now is you see people gather and place flowers. We do know that much of uh, the attention is going to shift to Windsor Castle, we would expect, in terms of protocol and funeral commemorations to come. Let's get some of those details and reaction generally from Andrew Pierce, who's a royal commentator with the Daily Mail. He is in London. If you've been a longtime watcher, I've had the great privilege of talking many times to Andrew at various royal occasions. I'm sorry it's a sad moment, Andrew, but I'm always happy to welcome you back to our program. Good morning. Good morning to you, Heather. <laughs> it's a very, very sad, but... Um, no surprise, 99 are great in it. Well, I was, I, it's exactly where I was going to begin. We can't be shocked. 99 and in failing health. We'd covered his month in hospital just a couple of weeks ago. And yet, still a vitality and strength of personality. It is a somber, a somber moment. Yeah, look, this is the, this is the longest royal marriage in, the history, in history. Uh, he's with the Queen for 73 years. What a remarkable remarkable marriage, a very happy marriage, not the easiest of marriages. But Heather, you know, when we saw that photograph of the Duke of Edinburgh in the car, leaving the hospital, going back to Windsor Castle, I actually wrote at the time and said at the time, I think and I fear that's the last time we see Prince Philip in public because he was very sick by then and he was going back to Windsor Castle to spend his last days. He knew he didn't have much time left with Her Majesty the Queen who's been with him since they got married in 1947. So in, 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 in fitting in the end, a man who had spent so much of his public life in the public eye, in the end, had quiet time with the woman who, who he adored. What kind of a void does this then leave, not just in her own life, Her Majesty's life, but really right at the heart of the monarchy, Andrew? Um, it's huge, actually, because you've got to think about this. There are two families here. There is the royal family, of which he was a stellar performer, uh, a, a, a stalwart consort to the Queen, a man who she referred to in one of her speeches as my guide. He guided her in many, many ways through many, many complicated and difficult decisions. But he was also head of her family, and he took those responsibilities very seriously. And we know stuff now that we didn't know at the time behind the scenes how involved he was in trying to uh, protect Princess Diana when she was going through her very difficult phases in the marriage with Charles, the, the, the compassionate speech he showed to her and to Sarah Ferguson when their marriages ran into difficulties because he knew how difficult it was for him marrying into the royal family back in 1947. And remember, he was a prince. He was, a, he was Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark. So he had to change his name. He became a Mountbatten. Which was, the mater which was the surname of his maternal grandparents, and then discovered to his horror that his children would not take his name, but they would be Windsors. That really was a difficult moment for him. But with everything else, Heather, he accepted it. Although in the end, I think it was about 10 years later, there was a compromise, and they became known as Windsor, uh, Mountbatten Windsor, the children. Yes. Uh, but he's been an extraordinary source of inspiration and advice to the Queen. My concern talking today is that it will be such a blow to the Queen. We may see much less of her now in public, and Prince Charles and Camilla will step up and take on even more responsibilities. I've been reflecting on that and wondering those very questions myself. You know, when you, when you speak with the Queen, and I know that we have done so when we've had interviews in London, Andrew, we've talked about duty. That seems to be the word that people use first and foremost in relation to Queen Elizabeth, her sense of duty. And yet, 
Prince Philip, in many ways, equally exemplified that trait because I mean, they became, she became queen much earlier than they'd expected. Their life upended yeah. by things. He's always had to walk, of course, as we famously say, those that one step behind. And yet, duty and responsibility and loyalty, those are words that we've come to associate with him. It was almost uh, Heather, a dual reign. Uh, and uh, on I, uh, when Prince, when there was a service for the Queen, I, I think we get there would have been so many jubilees. The jubilee where he was taken into hospital and they spent too much time on the River Thames and he got very cold. As she walked down the nave of Westminster Abbey or St Paul's Cathedral, she walked in her usual place, leaving a space for Prince Philip, who was in hospital. It was incredibly moving. It's because she spent her entire life with that man, that close to her, in the same position, and it never occurred to her to move more into the centre of the nave as she walked to her seat. She was leaving that space for Prince Philip, and it's going to be so difficult and has been so difficult for her on big state occasions not to have him there, but she completely understood his wish to step back from public life. But by God, he's given us decades and decades of service, and he hasn't been very well, actually, for a very long time. How about personal collect connections, Andrew? Did you ever meet Prince Philip? <laughs> I did. It's never easy meeting Prince Philip. Uh -huh. I like to not as a journalist, not as a royal commentator. I bet. Yeah. No. Well, you know, you like to think that we've got a way with talking to people. I can remember the very first time I met him. I was a very young reporter on the Times of London. I was in the Isle of Wight. There was a big boating festival called the Cows Festival. He's very much into water, likes his sport. He was there with Prince Edward, who I think actually will become the next Duke of Edinburgh. By the way. Uh, uh, and um, we were following him with a cat photographer. He wheeled round and fixed me with that gimlet glare of, of, of his and said, how many more photographs does your bloody newspaper need of me and my family? And as ever with royals, I wilted. And then there was an even better occasion, Heather. It was we were in Windsor Castle, a special reception for the media, because a certain young journalist, I think that might have been me, had been writing mischievous pieces suggesting that the country hadn't really been gearing up for the Queen's golden wedding anniversary. There were very few street parties planned. So the Queen and Prince Philip held a reception. Prince Philip, as you know, always regarded journalists as a problem. They have to, we, he had to deal with them if he had to deal with them. He would rather not. He came barging up to a group of journalists, one of whom worked for a newspaper which has Republican sympathies, and said, which newspaper do you work for? And when this guy said, I work for the Independent, he said, but your paper doesn't support my family. Why are you here? To which point this rather shell-shocked journalist said, because you invited me, sir, he said, but you didn't have to accept a bloody invitation and <laughs> don't drink too much of our wine. And off he went. A classic <laughs> Prince Philip moment, a wonderful moment, and nobody can forget it. And even the most seasoned politicians and uh, people in the public eye and journalists, when they met him, um, were always... He, he, he could put you at his ease, but he could also be very intimidating because he was very clever, very well-read, incredibly direct. Andrew, let me ask you finally, and I hope you don't mind, I'm just citing one of your fellow reporters in London. This is a reporter who works for Sky News, uh, just putting up something on Twitter that the funeral for Prince Philip will be held at St. George's Chapel in Windsor, well. and uh, the public has been asked not to attend because of the pandemic. I'm wondering if you yeah. have any information. Obviously, COVID-19 is going to change what we normally would have expected to see, the military procession and whatnot, but what information do you have? Well, what the original plan, um, there's always a code name for, for royal funerals. His was Operation Fourth Bridge, a bridge up in Scotland. And it would be what you call a royal ceremonial funeral. At ones below a state funeral. He, for instance, he did not want his body to lie in state in Westminster Hall, which is what happened to the Queen Mother. It would have been more on the level of Mrs Thatcher. Uh, but he wanted no fuss whatsoever. So the pandemic has played into his hands as he approached his last days. He may spend some time in a chapel in St. James's Palace in London, but I suspect not. So he will be in... Uh, the, the service will be in Windsor Castle. There will be no public invited. It will almost be a private service. The rules in this country are only 30 people during the pandemic can attend a funeral. So it could even mean the Prime Minister won't be there. It will be the Queen, her immediate family. That probably includes Prince Harry too, although I suspect the Duchess of Sussex won't come. Good excuse there. She's pregnant. 
uh, and, um, and we will see very little of it. That exactly is what Prince Philip will be chuckling as he reaches the great uh, royal uh, heaven in the sky, wherever they go. He'll be chuckling, thinking, I got my way in the end because he wanted no fuss. It sums up his whole view. So it'll be a very small uh, funeral in Windsor Castle, uh, and we will see very little of it. Isn't that interesting? Yes, it, that's such a good point in keeping with the no fuss request oh, on his behalf. When do you think, uh, Andrew, maybe you can instruct us in some protocol, when might we see or hear anything more from the Queen beyond the statement we got this morning? Well, um, uh, the, all we've been told is there will be sta statements to be released in due course. She will be at church on Sunday, of course, uh, uh, at the chapel, probably where the funeral is to be held. Uh, we'll see her then. Um, I suspect we won't hear very much now until uh, maybe on Monday. The country goes into eight days of national mourning. I suspect the funeral will be, if they haven't fixed the date already, uh, a week tomorrow. Uh, and, and then she will disappear from public view for a while. But I'm told that she's determined that the show will continue. She's been doing more and more public duties here. You know, the pandemic is... We've got this great vaccine rollout here, so the country is beginning to ease out of lockdown on Monday, but only in a very limited way. But it won't be enough for a big public funeral. So um, we won't hear much from her, I don't think, for a few days yet. And let's not forget one thing, Heather. She was married to that guy for 73 years. She fell wildly, madly in love with him. When she met him when she was 13, he was 18 or 19 on an official engagement. She had a crush on him. She got her way. She married him. The royal family didn't want her to marry him because he had no money. He was foreign. His mother had been in and out of a mental hospital, and his father was a gambler. He was from a really colourful background. But she got her way and she married him. And it's desperate for her to think the husband that she loves for 73 years is no longer with her. What a blow for her. Andrew Pierce. As always, it is just wonderful to have you on our program. Thank you very much for bringing all of that insight and experience to uh, our special coverage today, Andrew Pierce from London. We are getting confirmation, as Andrew was indicating, that we will get funeral details confirmed tomorrow. So we'll have full coverage here on CBC News Network as part of our weekend programming. Now, as we look live there at Buckingham Palace, where the flag remains lowered and where the crowds are gathering, the flowers are also being placed in tribute to Prince Philip. Our Tessa Arcilia has been live outside the palace for the last hour or so, talking to people why they have been drawn there. Good morning, Tessa. Tell us the latest you're hearing. Good morning, Heather. Yes, people are still gathering here, despite you know, the government uh, now had said that uh, they're discouraging people from going to royal residences. But you can see behind me, the, the crowd is still right in front of Buckingham Palace. Uh, they, they say they want to pay tribute. Uh, they want to just see what's going on. Um, but, you know, they're, they're also expressing some sort of sadness, but at the same time, not shock. He is 99. He was 99 years old. But we are hearing that they will soon be starting to clear the area. I was already seeing uh, some movement, you know, trying to, to close off some parts of the area. So I think we can expect that this might thin out as the hours go by. I did manage to speak to some of the people who were here. Let's take a listen to some of those. I thought, you know, I'll come down, pay a little bit of respects to, you know, where it's been a part of my life, really, um, from when I was a, younger, a young age. I, I did the Duke of Edinburgh's Award. I did this, the bronze, silver and gold, which, um, which most probably put me in good stead for my future years because it was uh, quite an achievement. Very, very sad. Um, it's very unfortunate that he didn't make the 100. Um, but he wasn't well. He looked so unwell when we've seen him on TV. And, um, yeah, it must be very difficult for the family now. Very sad. He's been a grand, grand gentleman and uh, a real character. And both my children have got Duke of Edinburgh's award, so uh, they both met him, which was a wonderful experience. So, yeah, we're all very sad about what's happened. But, you know, at that age, I suppose it was, it was expected, really, wasn't it? I mean, we were talking about the Duke of Edinburgh Awards throughout our coverage of his legacy, and it seems, you know, the people that I had spoken to uh, were, uh, you know, had taken part in that. Uh, so, as far as reactions here in the UK as well, we know... Parliament uh, had been recalled on Monday so that the uh, MPs of parliamentarians can pay their tribute as well. We also, of course, heard from the British Prime Minister earlier today. He, he paid tribute and uh, recognised the contribution of Prince Philip. Let's take a listen to him. Like the expert carriage driver that he was, he helped 
to steer the royal family and the monarchy so that it remains an institution indisputably vital to the balance and happiness of our national life. He was an environmentalist and a champion of the national world, natural world long before it was fashionable. With his Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, he shaped and inspired the lives of countless young people and at literally tens of thousands of events, he fostered their hopes and encouraged their ambitions. We remember the Duke for all of this and above all, for his steadfast support for Her Majesty the Queen. Not just as her consort, by her side every day of her reign, but as her husband, her strength and stay of more than 70 years. And it is to Her Majesty and her family that our nation's thoughts must turn today. We also heard from other former prime ministers. Tony Blair said our whole nation is united in sadness. He will be naturally most recognized as a remarkable and steadfast support for the Queen. We also heard from John Major. He said it's impossible to exaggerate the role that the Duke played in his lifetime, and he epitomizes the British spirit. And I have to say, Heather, just the atmosphere here, it is. it feels like something big is happening. You have helicopters in the air, of course, people gathering, and the world's media gathered here. He is one of the most recognizable figures he was. That is in the world, Heather. Tessa, thank you very much. And you'll be there for us in our ongoing coverage through the day here on CBC News Network. There is a Tessa Arcilia. And as we look live at Buckingham Palace again, just reminding you of the story that Tessa and I have been covering for some time, the fact that Prince Philip was in hospital for a month, the longest time he'd been in hospital for all 99 years of his life. We knew he was not there for COVID reasons. He was there for treatment for an infection and a pre-existing heart condition, we learned. He was moved from one hospital to another, St. Bartholomew's, which is a specialized facility for cardiac care, and then returned to King Edward VII. And then, as we just heard from Andrew Pierce, we were live as he was driven back from that hospital to Windsor Castle, where he passed away peacefully this morning. And as Andrew indicated, he had the impression that it might be the last time he was seeing Prince Philip alive. And um, Adrian Arsenault, I dare say that thought crossed my mind too as we aired those pictures on that morning. Looking at that location as people gather and pay tribute to someone really, I mean, the image of the Queen for more than 70 years he has been alongside. And these people are, are paying tribute and, and feeling some considerable sadness today. What do we know about official remembrances and funeral details for Prince Philip? Well, I would say a couple things, Heather. We have heard from the palace this morning uh, that, as expected, that the actual details will come out tomorrow, uh, not today. That, that that was always going to be the case, COVID or otherwise, that this day would be reserved for acknowledging him. Uh, the day after would be, you know, reserved for trying to figure out what to do next. It, of course, the added complication of COVID changes everything. I was in... London in 2002 when the Queen Mum died and I, I can't help but but think what it you know yes that was a really long time ago it was 19 years ago but what a very different feeling you know most people only knew her as a very old woman and, and didn't have a, a, a sense of her there were lots of stories of of her grit during the war but but this is different you know that it, it will obviously not be a huge event because of COVID but also by design Operation Fourth Bridge, which he oversaw, as you heard there from um, from Andrew Pierce, was very clear that that uh, that he didn't want to fuss. I can tell you effectively, yes. So let's start with the flags are, are being lowered to half masts across the UK. We don't yet know when we will see the Queen. But what tends to happen is that when members of the royal family emerge, you will see them donning dark colors and armbands. You'll also see those black armbands or black ties on members of parliament. Um, sometime soon in the next few days, uh, Philip's coffin will be moved to St. James Palace. It will then rest in the Chapel Royal. And so we, we understand it will stay there for about a, a week. And precisely seven days after the date of his death today, uh, so next Friday, his coffin will then move to the Queen's Chapel. That will be for a, a vigil that will be mounted by his children. 
So the day after that, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh will officially be laid to rest. So we're talking, at this point, it looks like next Saturday. That means a gun carriage procession will wind from the chapel. It will go past Buckingham Palace to Wellington Arch. From there, it will then make the journey through Windsor to St. George's Chapel. You'll remember that. That's where Meghan and Harry got married. Um, we know Prince Philip. We've said this before. He is eligible for a full state funeral. It's not what he ever wanted. Uh, so it will be a hybrid. It will be a royal ceremonial service to honor his life. It will take place that afternoon. How many people will be there, Heather? Uh, well, officially in the, in the UK right now, funerals are restricted to 30 people. Um, we know it will be small by necessity. Uh, it will be small by design. Um, and it will be designed around giving the queen some comfort uh, in the sense that she has lost the love of her life. You heard Andrew Pierce so beautifully uh, in his such an Andrew Pierce way talk about how uh, she had a crush on him for the first time she saw him. They actually met as kids. I think she was eight and he was 13. But then they met again when she was a teenager and uh, she, according to her cousin, was red faced and immediately thought he looked like a Viking and fell in love. Uh, and when they, they continued, uh, you know, an exchange of letters, announced their engagement, and four months later, they were doing exactly what you're seeing on the screen there, which is getting married. Uh, so it was a very quick courtship. Uh, they thought that they would have many years together to, to form their marriage. Um, but as you know, when, when the Queen's father died so suddenly in the 50s, this very young couple... Uh, were thrust into a position neither of them were really ready for. Uh, and then they have spent the next 73 years together, him always a few steps behind, um, as was his role, and he knew his place. Uh, and that leaves her today um, without the love of her life, without her mom, without her sister. Um, and, you know, it does, I think it doesn't matter how old you are when you realize at some point that You've lost your parents, and you've lost a sibling, and you've lost your husband. It's a really hard place for her, you know? She, in the last couple months in particular, Heather, is because of COVID, has been isolated from her grandchildren who, and you know, by all description, she ad adores them and adores her great-grandchildren and hasn't been able to see them. And she has watched the decline of her beloved. Um, and so this, Everything that happens in the next few days will be designed to give her, give her uh, some comfort. Yes. As you quite rightly point out, Adrian, um, Andrew Pierce giving us some insight, as he would as a longtime royal commentator, mm -hmm. and saying he does expect that she will be at church on Sunday, but otherwise we're not likely to see her. And indeed, he said with a certain sense of foreboding, he thinks mm -hmm. we'll see less and less of her in public yes. now. As yes. we look to the future. I think, I think, Heather, you have seen a hint of that in the last month or so. Um, it was striking to see the role of Prince Charles stepping up a, a little bit more visually. Um, he went to see his father mm -hmm. in hospital. Then we saw him with the Queen, a few photographs of him emerging with the Queen, um, going to various events. We hadn't seen much of that before. You see Prince William and, and Kate uh, stepping up as well. There was this soft signaling, if you were, uh, that, uh, that a role would have to be, big shoes would have to be filled. Indeed. Details to be confirmed tomorrow, and of course we'll have full coverage on CBC News Network and CBC Television. Thank you, Adrian, and certainly we'll be back to you as our coverage continues. Want to look again live at Buckingham Palace and keeping our watch on the crowds and the tributes and the flowers to Prince Philip and the flag that is lowered as it is in Ottawa, as it is throughout the Commonwealth. We have live pictures of Manitoba as we bring you reaction from within this country. A statement coming out from Premier Brian Pallister about how saddened he is to learn of the death of Prince Philip. A statement quite expansive, but at the end he does indicate there's an online book of condolence if anyone is interested in signing any Manitobans. And the statement particularly highlights the 10 separate royal visits and tours. The Duke of Edinburgh visiting communities across the province, officially opening the Pan Am Games in 1967, Canada's centennial year, celebrating Manitoba Centennial in 1970, the presentation of the Duke of Edinburgh 
Gold Awards in Thompson in 84, Churchill, a visit in 92, and touring parts of southern Manitoba after the floods there in 1997. And as the statement says, the Duke of Edinburgh connected directly with thousands of Manitobans. So one of the provincial tributes to Prince Philip. And I use Manitoba specifically because we know who's from there. Hello, Rosemary Barton. <laughs> there you go, my introduction to you. You're going to pick up from the provincial and move to federal yes. reaction. Yeah, so we are standing by again to hear from the Prime Minister at 11.30. I should point out this was his regularly scheduled pandemic briefing um, because that's of critical news as well. But he will uh, surely off the top of that talk about uh, his relationship with the monarchy, the Queen and indeed Prince Philip. He also put out a statement early this morning um, after the acting uh, Governor General, who is currently the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. I won't go through it all, but he talks about uh, his deep sadness of learning of the passing. He talks about Prince Philip's extensive service uh, to others, whether it be in his role as, as the royal consort, whether it be his commitment to the military, to the Navy, which is where he started, his various roles that he played, honorary titles that he had um, in Canada, and as well as, as you've been talking about extensively through the morning, his own Duke of Edinburgh Awards, which also benefited so many Canadian children. I'll skip ahead to the end of his statement where the Prime Minister says the following quote, Prince Philip was a man of great purpose and conviction who was motivated by a sense of duty to others. He will be fondly remembered as a constant in the life of our Queen, a lifelong companion who was always at her side offering unfailing support as she carried out her duties. A family has lost a beloved husband, father, grandfather and great grandfather. The thoughts of Canadians are with the Queen, Elizabeth II and members of the royal family as they mourn such a significant loss. Of course, the Prime Minister is, is himself in an interesting position to comment um, on the royal family because his family has had a long relationship with this Queen and Prince Philip looking through some photos of uh, the many times that Prince Philip has come to Canada, more than 70 times. There's a photo of um, Prince Philip and, and Justin Trudeau's mother <laughs> sitting off to the side as the spouses of, of two important people. There's another photo of Prince Philip standing at the door of 24 Sussex with Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre Trudeau. So we'll see whether he has any um, good memories from his childhood and, and beyond as Prime Minister of meeting Prince Philip. Um, I, in our research, there are some you know controversial moments that the, the prince had uh, during his visits here in Canada. He was at times, particularly in the, the late 60s and 70s, quite concerned about uh, whether Quebec would in fact separate from Canada. Um, and so he sort of reached out at one point to suggest that that separation should be amicable. He was, he was worried about how that would affect Canada's relationship with the monarchy. And the other story that I, I, I didn't know, but I, I laughed very hard at, he once um, went to Calgary. And as you know, in Calgary, they, they tend to give honored guests those white cowboy hats, um, and to which uh, Prince Philip said, oh, no, not another one, uh, and offered to say that he would use it as a flower pot or to carry water. So that seemed like the <laughs> Prince Philip that I have heard of. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but just to say that, yes, he visited Canada lots of times, but maybe he wasn't always um, thrilled with what he was receiving and his experiences <laughs> here. Um, I do want to end with the Premier of Ontario. Uh, he tweeted this morning his reaction. On behalf of all Ontarians, we send our deepest condolences to Her Majesty the Queen and the entire royal family. Prince Philip was a devoted husband, father, war hero and public servant, and he will be missed by many around the world. Doug Ford actually got his first uh, v vaccination this morning of AstraZeneca after previously criticizing uh, whether AstraZeneca should be used. He did get jabbed this morning. And I'll also just update people on where Ontario stands with COVID cases today because we have hit uh, a record a number of cases today, 4,227, um, which is uh, the last, you know, the last highest number we got was back in January. But this sets um, a new record in terms of one one time cases. And so we'll expect the prime minister to talk about that soon too, Heather. We should probably just talk about that for a moment more. 4,000 yep. on the way, potentially, according to projections. Rosemary, maybe 8,000 cases we could see. And we we're already talking before this breaking news of Prince Philip about how yep. uh, in, in Ontario they are now ordering, as of Monday, all hospitals, with the exception of those in the north of the province, to stop all non-emergency surgeries and, and yeah. to all non-emergency procedures so that they can make room in their ICUs for COVID patients. So.
Lots yeah. to come on that, I would imagine, from the Prime Minister today. Yeah, and I would just point out, of course, those numbers, Heather, represent our actions, Ontarians' actions from two weeks ago. They do not reflect what might have happened over the Easter long weekend. Um, if people did not follow public health rules, you're right, we could see those numbers much, much worse in just a matter of days. Ontario under a state of emergency, the third since the pandemic began, and under a full province-wide stay-at-home order. So, Rosemary, thank you. There Thanks, are many Heather. important stories going on, and I know you'll bring them to us. Rosemary, hosting for you as of 11 o'clock Eastern and leading up to that Prime Minister's briefing at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time. From uh, scenes of Buckingham Palace and talking about Canadian reaction, there is a look at Windsor Palace, Windsor Castle. And that is where our Margaret Evans is. She has traveled from London just that 40 minutes or so away to be right there, Windsor Castle, where Prince Philip passed away this morning. And Margaret, good morning. Thank you for joining this part of our special coverage. Set the scene for us. What is happening in Windsor? It's, well, you know Windsor well, Heather, and you know that for most royal uh, occasions, sad or happy, um, the streets here would normally be crowded. They're not crowded. There are growing numbers of people arri arriving, but it's a very kind of quiet, gentle scene. Obviously, the United Kingdom, like the rest of the world, in the midst of a pandemic, about to come out of a pandemic on Monday, or out of the lockdown in any case. Um, and that, of course, is changing um, the way in which um, uh, the funeral arrangements for Prince Philip would be handled. But here, right now, we're seeing really quiet scenes. Um, I'm just standing in front of Henry VIII Gate. People have been um, laying flowers there, but police have since been directing them to the long walk, um, potentially worried about traffic in and out, but of course they're also worried about big crowd scenes because of the pandemic. Margaret, when you mention, as you were, um, that that is where the funeral is going to be held, and we don't have the details confirmed just yet, we expect a full accounting of things tomorrow, but we are getting indication that the funeral will be held right there at St. George's Chapel at Windsor. That is where the statement tells us, and we know that he passed away, and that is where the Queen and Prince Philip had really spent the better part of the last year, correct? That's right. They've kind of been in what royal officials would call a a bubble base, Bubble HQ, has been here at Windsor Castle. Um, a reduced staff caring um, for the Queen and Prince Philip. They both received their vaccinations back in January. Um, but normally you would see the Queen and Prince Philip um, having spent a bit more time apart. He tended to spend more time at Sandringham. As you know, he retired from public duties back in 2017. So we haven't seen as much of him, but that might be one of the small blessings, if you can call it that, of the pandemic, in that the Queen and Prince Philip actually spent a much greater part of the past year together here at Windsor Castle. Margaret, thank you very much. I really appreciate we'll be hearing from you, I know, as our coverage continues. Margaret Evans at Windsor Castle. And I see that backdrop and think of uh, 2018 and May of that year as Prince Philip underwent a hip replacement operation in order to be able to walk into that St. George's Chapel unaided to attend and participate in the wedding of his grandson, Prince Harry. And we think of that a joyous moment for the royal family in May of 2018. It will be the scene for Prince Philip's funeral. We would expect one week from tomorrow. But again, as I say, details to be confirmed tomorrow. Today is a day of reflection and looking at the legacy and the impact of Prince Philip and the void he leaves in the monarchy, in the royal family. Alison Eastwood is with us. She's the editor-in-chief of Hello Canada. She's in Toronto this morning. And Alison, it's uh, good to welcome you back to the program. We often turn to you on Matters Royal, and uh, it's a sad one, but really I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation because I don't know if there's a magazine with more photos of the royal family over the years than Hello Magazine. So your thoughts, number one, on, on the passing of Prince Philip. Well, Heather, I guess, as you can imagine, this is the day, one of the days that we've been dreading. And um, we were very much hoping, of course, that Prince Philip would uh, make it to his 100th birthday on June the 10th. Um, you know, all signs were pointing to him being on the road to recovery as much as a 99-year-old could be. Um, I'm sure the Queen is very much hoping for that. Um, I guess the overwhelming feeling right now is just a huge amount of sadness for the Queen to lose the man who's been by her side um, 
really since she was a teenager and um you know i just yes. i can't imagine what she's going through right now as well as the rest of her her family you know his children his grandchildren um so that's sort of uh, you know the way that i'm looking at it yeah, now from, i mean from it's from a personal it's, standpoint when you say mm -hmm. yes to the time i mean the glint in her eye from the earliest time in her <laughs> life really once she laid eyes on prince philip 73 years married uh, the relationship as you perceived it allison so, yeah, they've had quite an extraordinary love story. Um, you know, we've seen snippets of it as portrayed on The Crown, although Prince Philip is not, was not exactly as he was portrayed there uh, by either actor. But, uh, yes, they, they first met at the Royal Naval College back in 1939 um, when she was on a, a visit there with her parents. She was just 13 years old, and she was instantly smitten by him and the fact that he could eat a huge heaping plate of shrimp, apparently, at dinner. <laughs> and, and he left a big impression. <laughs> they were the third cousins, um, as I'm sure you've discussed, um, related. They were both great-great-grandchildren of Queen Victoria, so just, just distant, distant enough for it to be okay. And um, really, um, although she did have quite a lot of suitors, contrary to popular belief, he was her one and only true love. And uh, he felt very similarly toward her as well. You know, they corresponded avidly during the war where, you know, he was a much decorated Navy lieutenant um, and um, even more blue blooded than she was actually being related to royalty on two sides. And um, you know, they were just very steadfast right from the get-go. Um, you know, things really solidified when she was 17 and he came to Windsor Castle for Christmas. I, I mean, you know, just think of that. She's 95 now almost. Uh, you know, he was 99. And, um, uh, you know, there's really that's, that's the thing to, to, to focus on uh, on top of everything else is, is just like that this legacy of love that yes. they left. Yes. And, um, and also a great deal for, for their children, their grandchildren, and, of course, their great-grandchildren, of which they have 10 now. Can I, I pause there on the children because I want to come back. You raised the crown, Allison, so I'm going to go there <laughs> because I was mentioning earlier the, the cast and the production crew behind the crown, such a successful series, have already paid tribute and expressed their sadness at the passing of Prince Philip. I am someone who came to the crown late, but I have been loving every season, of course, and I've been, in I've been enthralled by the character of... of Prince Philip, and you say he was not, he's not what he, as he was portrayed on that series. So anybody who's followed along, as so many have, I suppose, how is it different? Well, I think the predominant difference is really in terms of how his, his rakish nature was portrayed in the early seasons. Um, you know, certainly he, um, had, as one of uh, the Queen's biographers said, he always had an eye for a pretty girl, but actually he uh, he was devoted to Elizabeth and, um, you know, was not was not in any way unfaithful to her. Um, he, you know, he was very much a pragmatist, actually, and he described himself as such. But when it came to his relationship with the Queen, there was, uh, you know, there was definitely a softer side uh, to him. Some of the things you saw on the crown were, you know, definitely based in fact. Um, he, you know, he was a little uh, harder on Prince Charles growing up. You know, they have very different personalities. He was very close to Anne. You know, she has already said that her life will be unimaginably different without him in it. They, um, you know, they had very similar personality types. And we did see that portrayed in the crown. And also the sense of, you know, what am I going to do when I have to give up my career for the woman I love? Now what? That yes. was very much grounded in reality. Um, even Anne said that they really hadn't thought through what the role of a royal consort would be in that day and age. But we know what it became over the course of 73 years. You mentioned the children and that special relationship with Anne. Uh, in terms of his place in the family with the extended family, Allison, the grandchildren, and now the great-grandchildren, what was his role and what was his relationship with them? He had a very... I mean, as often happens, I think that, you know, they... Both he and the Queen had a, a close and loving relationship with all of their grandchildren. 
Um, you know, they all live fairly close by. Prince William famously used to go and visit his grandparents on weekends when he was at Eton College, when he was a teenager. You know, they have a much more, probably sort of an easier relationship than uh, maybe Charles did, uh, certainly with Philip growing up. Um, you know, we know that Philip came from a very fractured, fragmented uh, household. He, you know, his family had to flee Greece when he was just a baby. They smuggled him out in an orange crate. He never had that sense of stability. And he really, I think, craved that and really appreciated that, like, all of his life. Alison, I'm wondering, I mean, we focus with you and, uh, and quite rightly on the personal and on the relationships and on the family and Prince Philip's role really at the center, at the heart of that royal family. As far as broader impact, maybe a closing thought on, on how he should be remembered and legacy. I think his legacy will be Bringing, helping to bring the monarchy into the 21st century, no doubt about it. He was a galvanizing force. And, um, you know, we have him to thank for really how relatively progressive the monarchy has been um, over the years. And, it, and it's, it's, only, it's only recently that he's taken a back seat. And, um, you know, we can... The, the Queen has a lot to thank him for, but... He certainly had everything to thank her for as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Allison Eastwood is the editor in chief at Hello Cat. Will you be do I, one quickie? Are you going to be doing a special tribute edition? Do you think, Allison? Yes, we're doing a special tribute edition. It will be on newsstands uh, starting next Thursday. I expected as much. Thank you, Allison. Nice <laughs> to have you back on this morning. I appreciate it, Allison Eastwood. Again, a look at Buckingham Palace as the mourners arrive to pay tribute to Prince Philip and uh, remember him. You know that Tessa Arsili is there, our reporter bringing us comments. And here's some more of what the people are telling her in terms of why they are coming there to Buckingham Palace and what they're remembering about Prince Philip. Oh, the Prince Philip was a wonderful father and a real asset to British life. And I'm sure the Queen is grieving terribly. My wishes to her and as much support as I can offer and the nation can offer. Very sad news. He's a lovely guy. Um, very sad for the monarchy. Oh, it's really sad. You know, he's part of the monarchy. It's the royal family. You know, they'd, him and the Queen had been married for over 70 years, yeah, 70 yeah. years, and it's just a really sad moment. You know, we know he'd been ill for quite a long time, and it's just really sad. And um, we're just really sorry to the royal family for their sad news. Some of the reaction from London at the death this morning of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, at the age of 99, his 100th birthday was in June, passing away this morning peacefully, as the statement from the palace tells us. Now, we're looking live at Ottawa. In terms of reaction coming in, the Senate issuing a formal statement that I will share with you now, mourning the passing of His Royal Highness and celebrating, as the Senate describes it, his long and remarkable life. Boris Johnson called it an extraordinary life, a similar theme, long and remarkable life. The century of his lifespan was marked by significant change, both in Canada and around the world. The death of the Duke of Edinburgh marks the end of an era. And then it goes on to highlight his successful naval career, how he was the longest serving British consort, and how he traveled so extensively uh, throughout Canada and the Commonwealth, and also launched the Duke and Edinburgh Awards in 1956. We've already paid tribute to that today. The Senate offering its deepest sympathies and joining in sorrow. So. That is the latest statement from Canada. We'll hear more in terms of Canadian reaction from Rosemary Barton, our chief political correspondent, who's going to be in and taking over our special coverage from here at 11 o'clock Eastern. We look at Buckingham Palace and can tell you that, again, the only word thus far from the Queen and the Palace is the statement that came out this morning about four hours ago announcing the death peacefully at Windsor Castle of Prince Philip at the age of 99. And we do know that we expect to hear details tomorrow as far as a funeral, it will be held at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle, likely one week from tomorrow, a much scaled down affair owing to COVID protocol. But again, we will have full details tomorrow. Today, a day to remember the legacy, the mark of the man, and to hear him in his own words.
You've got to get away from the idea that it is possible or even desirable to tell people what is good for them. Instead, I believe we should set out to expose people, particularly young people, to as wide a variety of rewarding experiences as possible. Ignorance is the mother of bigotry and the only the narrow-minded find it possible to be bored. Now, many of these animals that are in danger are in danger because they're being exploited, but not in a, in a practical way. In other words, that we're, we're taking more than a sustainable yield. Can I ask you finally if, if people are now coming forward at a point when it's really too late, or are you an optimist? I believe that it, it's late. There's no question about it. It's very late indeed in the, in the, in the slippery slope to, to a really explosive situation. But I think that uh, we do have a chance, but it's going to need a, a, a growth in public support. If we can go on with that, we may eventually, well, we may not put off a, a, a disaster, but I think we might put off a catastrophe. As I was asked to start off uh, the Olympic Games in Melbourne, where I made, if I may say so, the best speech of my life. <clears throat> Which is exactly five words. <laughs> Britain is not just an old country of tottering ruins inhabited by idle roues in eyeglasses, <laughs> where yokels quaff ale by the tankard outside rickety pubs. The, the thing is, the, the monarchy is, is part of the kind of fabric of the country, and as the fabric alters, so the monarchy and its people's relation to it alters. Now, in 1953, the, the situation in this country was totally different to what it is now. We were a great deal younger, and I think uh, young people, a young queen and young family is infinitely more newsworthy and amusing than, you know, we're getting on from middle age, and I dare say when we are uh, really ancient, <laughs> there might be a bit more reverence again. <laughs> I don't know.